this is Dave Brown from Vasana Blade Works. You're listening to the Bladeology Podcast. All right, so we're going to jump into this like we do every week. Welcome to another episode of the Bladeology Podcast. This is episode 31, if I'm remembering myself correctly. Uh, we are on with our original host lineup this week. We are on with a special guest. This is the vocal representation of Jeremiah Burbank from PVK Vegas. Nick Chuprin of NCC Knives. And Elijah Isham of Isham Blade Works. Awesome. And who do we have on with us this week? Justin from Justin Lundquist Knives. Sick. Awesome. Thank you for taking time with us and uh, coming on to talk. Sure. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Um, so yeah, let's let's jump into it. Where did um, how did we get here? Where where did you start with your <laughs> with your knife journey, so to say? Well, it actually goes back to all the way to four years old. Uh, I was talking to my mom actually like a month or two months ago. I was kind of grilling her about some of my earliest memories of my first knives, and I actually thought that it was started around five or six years old. Or no, actually, sorry, I thought it started around seven or eight. And uh, she'd remembered that the very first knife she gave me was when I was four years old. And uh, I was born in Colorado, and my parents separated And when I was about two. And my mother and I moved from Colorado to Florida. So when I was growing up in Florida, one of the things I did a lot was go fishing. And so at the age of four, when I was going fishing and stuff, she had given me a small like fixed blade uh to go with the tackle box and the fishing gear. And uh, I don't remember the knife. I wish I still had it. Um, But I definitely must have been enamored with it because she said that uh, I took it and I was playing with it in the house. And I started cutting the screen door to the patio with it just because I wanted to like cut stuff with it. I wanted to use it for something. Um, So that was the very first one. (laughs) Oh, man. All right. Just getting in there, cutting stuff, huh? Yeah, I was just going for it right from the beginning. Um, so I don't really remember the knife. I remember the fishing, and I remember enjoying fishing. I remember the the uh, fishing pole and the tackle box and little bread balls for bait and crap like that. Um, but the earliest knives that I remember was not that much later. I was, I think, five or six. Um, and the the first one I remember from five or six was just your typical Swiss army knife that I think my mom had given me as a gift. And I had it for a really long time. I wish I still had it. So it got lost somewhere along the way. But um, it was just your typical red Swiss army knife. I don't remember which model it was. And I think she might have given it to me on our right before we left for our first camping trip. And on that camping trip, again, I wanted to use the knife and be doing something with it. So I was like, oh, I'm going to start whittling some wood or something. You know, I'm five or six. I'm like, what else am I going to do? And uh, of course, I, you know, didn't know what I was doing and I wasn't holding the stick properly so that I would be cutting away from my hand and I was cutting towards my hand, slipped and sliced my finger open and uh, sliced it really good. Still can see the scar to this day. And but I still, I kept it for a long time and always cherished it because it was a gift. And I, I mean, I loved it anyways. I learned my life lesson, you know, cut away from yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Yeah. That's crucial. So I learned that life lesson, you know, real quick. Um, made sure not to do that again. Um, so that was around five or six, and that was the earliest memory. And then going forward from there, I think around a couple years year two years after that um probably seven or eight i guess we started going to uh like local fairs that would come once a year like a state fair and uh i didn't really care about the fairs at all i just i i was never someone who cared about like roller coasters or rides or whatever i didn't really give a shit but they had funnel cakes and they had a ring toss and I don't know what they called it, but it was the kind of thing where it was like they had um, a bunch of 
like the glass Coke bottles lined up in rows, like a big grid of Coke bottles. And you would give them your tickets and they would give you these yellow plastic rings that you would throw at the Coke bottles and you would try to get them to land over the mouth of the Coke bottle. Sounds really easy, but once it hits them, they start bouncing everywhere and they bounce away. Well, depending on if you got like the center bottle going out, the center was the most points and then going out was less and less. Well, the prizes for this game were pocket knives. (laughs) I don't even know how that was like legal or a thing where it's like the prizes that you're giving kids were knives. Like all sizes, like because like the center would be the highest, uh, you know, the most points and then going out would be lower and lower. So if you got it in the center, you could pick a bigger knife and they had all the way up to like. I don't know, like six inch fixed blade, like big, huge fixed blade buoy knives down to like little slip joints. And I mean, they were garbage, you know, they were like, you know, they were cheap pieces of junk, but as like a seven or eight year old, I didn't have to pay. And it was a way to like, you know, get new knives to play with and stuff. So I always thought that was cool. And that was the only thing I cared about at the fair (laughs) was trying to see if I could get some new knives to take home with me. Um, so that kind of started like uh, sort of a little collection of crappy knives that I had. And, you know, I didn't know anything. I was too young to know anything of like production companies and, you know, production knives or whatever. And I had no idea of where people would even go to buy knives. This was literally like the only place, the only way I knew of getting them. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I didn't have internet or anything like that. So it's like, I didn't know any better. Um, but so I thought that was really cool. And, you know, I knew that they were just like inexpensive or whatever, but they were all different like styles and shapes and profiles and blade shapes and styles and everything. So it was interesting to me to see the different, you know, designs and everything. Um, so that was, you know, for a few years while I was younger. And then, uh, the next knife, the Swiss army knife was one that was like kind of special because it was from my mom that she had given me and it was like actually a decent knife. The next one that was more of a decent knife that uh, I still have to this day was the Schrade's version of the Buck 110. I think I think they called it the LB7. Uh, it pretty much looks exactly like the Buck 110, but it's I think a tiny bit bigger and it's a real heavy, I mean, it's a brick. It's got solid brass bolsters on the front and back, uh, like front and front and rear bolsters and rosewood handle in between the brass bolsters. Um, I still have that to this day. That was a monster knife, and I always thought that was really cool. Um, those were the two like half decent, you know, ones that I had for a long time, um, and that was going up to like I don't know, being about eleven or twelve years old or so. And then uh, I think around that time of being about 12 or so, I found my mom had a, she had a K-Bar Little Fin. I don't know if you know what that is. It's, um, they made it for a long time. I I don't think they make it anymore, but uh, it was one of those stacked leather knives and uh, just a fixed blade, leather sheath, stacked leather knives. And I think the pommel, was maybe aluminum or something um so she had one of those and i found that in her closet for some reason i was rummaging through her closet i don't know why found the knife and i was like oh my god this thing is amazing and (laughs) what i used to do is just to like pass time when i was bored i would go out in the backyard and we had these elephant ear plants i think it's what they're that was what i called them i don't know what they're actually called but elephant ear plants and like big huge banana plants and I would throw the knife at them, just like throwing knives. And because there was like a, you know, the texture of them was perfect for like knives sticking into it. And I would just do that for hours, just throwing her knife at these stupid plants, just like passing the time throwing these knives. And uh, eventually I threw it so much and it, I beat on it so much that it finally started to separate and everything started to come apart. And I felt horrible because I don't know if she ever knew. I mean, she must have known that I would take it 
I don't know. I, I to this day don't know if she knew that I would take it out and play with it for like hours, throwing it at the fence and throwing it at the plants or not. Um, and then I felt bad because once it started separating and coming apart, I think I kind of like tried to just shove it back together, stuck it back in the sheath and then just jammed it back, buried it in the closet. <laughs> That's fine. That's all right. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so I, I felt bad about that. It was a cool little knife. And I mm. wish I wish we still had that. I wish I wouldn't have destroyed it. Um, but that those were kind of the knives that I had around uh, up until up until high school that's what was going on and then going into high school the knives i still had them but they kind of dropped off and i kind of forgot about them for a long time because going into high school i got into photography and i went to a high school for the arts and photography became my thing and that was what i fell in love with and so i did that through high school and then i did that all through college went to a college of the arts uh in chicago and moved up to chicago to go to college and then, <clears throat> excuse me, when I got out of college, uh, graduated my degree in photography, I started photo assisting. And one of my friends, uh, he always had a pocket knife on him. And, and I had forgotten about, you know, at, at this point, I had long forgotten about my pocket knives and everything. And I didn't have anything on me. I think I had like a multi-tool, um, like a, I forget, what's the, what's like the Like a Leatherman or something? Yeah, like a Leatherman. So I think I had a Leatherman on me um, as I was assisting, but I didn't really like it. I didn't like carrying it on my belt, you know, and it's too big for a pocket. And uh, One of my friends that I worked with a lot had a pocket knife on him all the time and he would always pull it out and use it. I always see it. And then I'd, I wound up constantly like asking him to borrow it. And I was like, this is fucking ridiculous. I need to get a pocket knife. So I wound up just buying the same one that he had, which was the uh, SOG uh, X-Ray Vision. <laughs> Such a cheesy name. <laughs> oh, God. So that knife, and at that time when I got that, I still literally had no clue about uh, this custom world. And I had no clue of how many production companies were out there. I only knew of SOG because he had one. And I think I had heard of Benchmade because another assistant had a Benchmade. And I think those were the only two companies I actually had heard of at this point. So uh, I bought the SOG and <clears throat> that knife was my EDC. That was like my first EDC that was on me every single day without fail. And I carried and used that thing every single day for a couple of years, at least. And then, uh, and, and still just, I had it on me every day and I used it every day, but I still wasn't in this knife world. I still did had no idea that this crazy world existed. Um, I didn't think anything about it. I just used it and that was it. I didn't think about it. It was just a tool that I had and used. Um, so... I think so that went on for a number of years go forward and you know I don't know how many years a couple years five years or something after college however many and I wound up losing it well I didn't lose it I was going I was flying somewhere and we were going into an airport and I had the knife on me because I always had it on me without fail and I'd forgotten to leave it home so <laughs> Walking into the airport, I remembered it was on me and I was like, oh shit, what am I going to do? And I had no time to try to figure out what to do because I was running late. So I literally threw it in the garbage can outside the front of uh, the airport. So right before I went in, I threw it in the garbage can. I was like, well, there goes that. So after the trip, I was like, all right, well, I need to get another knife and uh, still didn't know of like, you know, this whole world or whatever. And started looking at SOG's website and I was like, ah, let's, you know, look for something different and kind of started trying to search to find something else, see if there was something else. And, uh, somehow, I don't know how stumbled into a few, one or two handmade customs. And I was like, wait, what, what do they mean? Handmade. And, you know, I never really thought about it. I just kind of figured that knives were made in some big factory. I had no idea what, was required in metalworking or anything like that. 
And I just assumed you had to be a big, huge company with a huge factory with huge machines to, you know, create these, these things. And uh, so I stumbled into this custom handmade, one or two images of custom handmade pieces. And I was like, what the hell is this? And I was floored. And so I started like Googling it and trying to research and figure out what this was. I mean, I couldn't quite even wrap my brain around it at first. And I, and I just went down the rabbit hole. <laughs> that's how that's how it happens mm-hmm. I for a lot of people. Yeah. Just went down the rabbit hole. I mean, at that point, I literally would get home, and I so I was still working doing the photo jobs. So I would get home in the evening, and uh, I would sit down, pull out the laptop, sit down with the computer on my lap, and I would probably sit there for five straight hours just searching and googling custom knife makers. And I did that every night for probably five hours straight for probably like two weeks or something. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I was just completely like blown away. That is not as an addiction just saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we've all I, been there. <laughs> yeah. I just was so shocked because uh I don't know. I just I just had no idea. So I found uh pretty early on what happened was I found the different dealers websites, you know, like um, the high end dealer websites and well, any of them, but I mean, not really so much blade HQ, but more like um, oh, what are the high end sites? I can't like, think of like, the name. Um, yeah. Knife like treasures, knife treasures, art, yeah, knife legends, exactly. Place like that. Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But places like, like knife treasure, places like that, not places yeah. like blade HQ. I still had no idea places like blade HQ existed. Like, like art knife stuff. Yes, exactly. Okay. So I found these dealers who were dealing the art knives and I found them real early on in this time when I was searching like crazy. So, then I would, you know, see their list of artists and I would start at the top, find the artist's name, look at the picture. If it was interesting to me, then I would do a Google search for them. And I would sit there searching that person and everything I could find on that person. Then once I exhausted that, I'd go to the next person on the list. (laughs) I literally would go down the list name by name by name for every dealer site that I could find. That's diligent. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, yeah, it's an amazing resource, but you can get carried away and it can be a detriment because then you can get like, thinking about everybody else's work totally know. totally well, he wasn't a designer it, at this point yeah mm-hmm. no yeah. totally i wasn't a designer and uh but it's interesting that you say that because you know i see both i've seen people say oh i don't look at you know other makers work i don't search around this that, the other because i don't want to be influenced which i can understand both points of view um but the flip side of that is if you don't look around, you know, you also, you know, there could be other people doing the same exact thing. You think you're doing something that no one else has done, but yeah, you really have to use it to your own, like, yeah. your own advantage. Exactly. Your way. Yeah. Yeah. So that went on for a little bit. And, uh, then I, Let's see. Then I guess I, I, so I was searching all these makers and hadn't really started looking into how to making knives yet. I was still just like, oh my God, these are amazing. I want one. Cause remember I was looking originally, I was sitting down to look to buy an a quote unquote affordable production knife. <laughs> remember that was, that was supposed to be what I was doing. Um, <laughs> now I'm looking at knives that are on, you know, art treasure and they're like, you know, 30 five, grand, 5,000 to 30 grand. And I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? How is this possible? <laughs> and uh, so then, uh, you know, I kind of started searching for custom makers who weren't the art knife guys doing 30 grand. <clears throat> and I found a few. And so the first ones that I found, uh, what's the guy's name? Oh, God, now I'm going to forget. Uh, three. Three Sisters, Three Sisters Forge? Oh, Three Three Sisters Sisters Forge. Is that what it's called? Three Sisters Forge. So him and the other one was um, uh, 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 Gene Wiseman was the other one, were two of the early ones that I found early on who were custom guys doing hand making that had, you know, affordable prices. And uh, they were the first two that I had reached out to that I bought handmade customs from. And, uh, I, 
I ordered one from Gene, and bless his heart, he's very, very nice and patient. <laughs> I probably drove the guy crazy because this was, you know, I was just getting into this, just beginning to scratch the surface, and I sent him so many emails with so many stupid questions, and I was just like going back and forth with all my decisions because I, you know, this was all new and I couldn't make my decisions on what I wanted. And anyways, I did order a slip joint from him. I still have it. And it was, um, the first one he ever did with lightning strike carbon fiber. And the first one he ever did with a G10 liner under the scales. Um, and then I got the three sister or the three, what is it called? Three sisters forge, three rivers. Mm -hmm. What is it called? Three Sisters Forge? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. The Beast. So his his popular knife back then was the Beast. And so that was the next uh custom that I had. Um and then and I didn't have a ton of money, and so really I should not have even been buying the customs. Like I didn't really have the money to be doing it. I mean, I was working and whatever, but I didn't really have like, you know, the spare cash to get into that as a hobby or whatever. Um so I did have them for quite a while and I still have the slip joint. I don't have the beast anymore. Um, so I did end up at some point getting some other production knife um, for my regular EDC. I don't remember what it was at this point. Um, shoot, I, I don't remember what it was. Uh, I remember you had a, a poltergeist design for a while, right? Yeah, that was a little bit later. I've mm -hmm. I've had a handful of customs, but not. I've never had a huge collection and it's never been like anything super expensive. I had, I had the poltergeist, um, for a little bit. I had, uh, what else did I have? Oh, I had, a uh, boost blades. Oh I had, yeah. I had like his, blade? yeah, his, um, did you say fixed blade? Yeah, do boost the fixed blade maker, Boosie? No, 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 no. He's no, talking no. about the the folder, the folder oh, designer okay. makes really right. slim knives. Well, designs yeah. really slim knives. So early, early, early on, before he had his CNC machine, before he had his shop, when he was first starting, he did uh, his arrow design. I think that's how you say it. Um, with uh, uh. Is it Zodiac? C and Zodiac? Zodiac Engineering? Yes. Uh, Ken Spaulding, right? Sounds right. I think that yep. was who he was doing with. Yeah. yeah, so Ken made a run with him. Uh, and so I had one of those. And um, those were built really well. Uh, Ken knew what he was doing. Um, and that was a nice design. It was actually, it was actually a really nice design really really nice uh build it was done extremely well it was probably one of the better um uh customs that i had um i actually still wish i had that one i let that one go i pretty much let all of them go because i i couldn't afford to have them um and i had one or two others front i had a front flipper from a guy in south africa um who's no longer with us he's passed away a couple years ago i can't remember his first and last name his last name started with a g uh but he passed away a couple years ago and then uh just one or two other little odds and ends i i always uh i never had like the funds to really get into collecting and so that was kind of probably part of well not probably but that was part of the impetus into trying to get into building and designing is because I didn't have the money to collect and all, all those pieces came after I started building. Um, but you know, I had that thought of like, well, these things are so expensive and I always liked to build things with my hands and make things with my hands and be creative. Cause you know, I went to school for the arts and even though my majors were in photography, I was always doing drawing and painting and sculpture and stuff. And so I always liked to create things and build things and create stuff from scratch. So <clears throat> I had it in my head, like, well, so the early ones that I got were the beast and the the slip joint from Wiseman. Those were the ones I had before I started thinking, um, oh, I should just try to make these. So I had this thought of these are so expensive. I can probably teach myself how to make them and build them. Um, and it would be more affordable than trying to, you know, buy one. 
And I will tell anybody out there <laughs> that is the <laughs> wrong way to go. <laughs> it's way more expensive. <laughs> It'd be totally cheap if I just build myself a car. No yeah, problem. Exactly. That's, the, the That's a good analogy. That's a good analogy. Like if you think it's cheaper to build it, it just the car analogy is perfect. If you think it's cheaper to just build your own car than to go buy one, you're fucking wrong. Go buy a car. Don't try to build it. Just, just oh, that's not necessarily one. true because that's how I became a knife maker. And here I am now, <laughs> 10 years later. <laughs> Nick was building <laughs> cars. I mean, knives. Yeah, I was like, oh, no one does compound ground tantos really at the time. I guess I'll just do it. Yeah. So before Instagram. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you decided you were like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to take a swing at this. So uh, I, I started slowly kind of like, I I knew nothing about metalworking. I mean, okay. So keep him. Okay. So I'm living in Chicago, right? I moved from Florida to Chicago to go to college. Um, so I'm out of college working freelance. Um, and well, I should back up a little bit and so i'm i'm working freelance in photography and myself and a friend of mine we started a side business uh he had his own thing going and i had my freelance thing going and then together we decided to do a business where we were going to make some photography products and uh like the first thing we were going to make was a an accessory and the second thing that we made was an actual four by five film camera so this was going on. <laughs> you made wait, sorry, you made a four by five? Like the, yeah. you're talking about like um four by five whole, film camera. Yeah. The whole camera? Yeah. Or just like just like yeah. a simple like So anybody listening who doesn't know what a four by five film camera is. So if you think of way back when guys had the huge camera on the tripod with the bellows and they put the dark cloth over their head to look at the glass and they have the cloth over their head and they take one picture and they pull the dark slide out of the back and then they flip it around and they push it back in and it's a big huge sheet of film that's a that's a sheet film camera so you made like a Graflex, basically basically yes so what we did was uh our first product was uh, I'll try not to get too strung out on this, but it kind of relates. So the first product was um, a, a pinhole cap for digital cameras. So when I was in photography, I was I started out. I, I got into photography in ninth grade, and so back then, you know, film was still a big thing, and I was very much into black and white film and uh, black and white printing and manual cameras. And once I was in college, I got into sheet film because it was huge negatives. You could do alternative processes, alternative prints, platinum, palladium prints, whatever. I won't get into all that. But uh, you had huge negatives that had a lot of detail and clarity, and you could do a lot of different things with them. And I got into, along with the sheet film, I got into pinhole cameras. And with pinhole cameras, you can you build your own cameras. And basically, it can be just a cardboard box that's light tight. You put a piece of sheet film that's a four inch by five inch sheet of film in the box against one side, and you have a pinhole on the other side, and the pinhole is the lens. So you can take one image and then you process it, and it has uh, it just has a unique look to it. You can if you just Google search pinhole images, you can see it has a unique look to it. But there's all kinds of things you can do, and you can be really creative with it because you can build your own cameras and you can get really crazy. <clears throat> So, uh, this business that we started was, uh, when micro four thirds digital cameras first came out, I saw a, uh, commercial for them. And instantly I was like, holy shit, that's the answer right there. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So there had always been for a long time, if you know what a camera is and you don't have the lens on the camera and you have a body cap to cover the open body. That's the body cap that just goes in place of the lens. There's always been body caps that have pinholes in them. So you can shoot pinhole images on your regular film camera or regular digital camera. But to me, they were always, yeah, to me though, they were always pointless because they weren't wide angle enough to get the vignetting and some of the distortion because the pinhole was too far away from the film plane. So what it wound up looking like was just a soft image 
with a regular lens. So to me, it defeated the purpose. So we won't get strung out into all the details, but it just defeated the purpose. Well, when the Micro Four Thirds camera came out, there was no mirror in the body. Now, on a regular camera, when you take the lens off, you can't stick something back into the body and take a picture because the mirror flips up and down and you'll the mirror will hit whatever's sticking into it. Well, when Micro Four Thirds came, Micro Four Thirds came out, it was a mirrorless camera. There's no mirror in it. So when you take the lens off, there's just empty space from the face of the camera traveling back to the microchip, the sensor. There's there's no mirror, it's just empty space. So that meant that I could take a pinhole cap and make a new design where instead of the cap being flat, the cap sinks down into the body like a triangular cone sinking into the body going towards the sensor. So that gave me the wide angle, which gave me the vignette and the distortion and everything. So now it looked like pinhole again, which other body caps did not look like pinhole. So anyways, we started this company with this idea. (laughs) Very long-winded. But uh, that was the first product. We did a Kickstarter, and it was successful. And uh, But the thing, how this all relates is... um, that was when we first started getting into doing CAD uh, CAD work. I had never done CAD work before. And I had never done quote unquote product design before, other than just like building my own, you know, pinhole cameras out of like cardboard boxes or wood boxes or something. So we started um, learning, we started teaching ourselves CAD, we started teaching ourselves product design, did the Kickstarter. Um, but this also, gave us the chance to start reaching out to manufacturers and start learning on our own uh, OEM. And that was how we started kind of learning that whole entire process of OEM and everything. And uh, we did the first one that was successful. Then we did the second one. The second one was an actual four by five camera. But we did was it was an injection molded um, plastic polycarbonate four by five camera. And it was a super lightweight handheld point and shoot four by five that could be used as a four by five with a lens or could be a pinhole camera and this one was way more complex it was it was simple in terms of a camera but it's complex in terms of us making something and doing oem and doing cad work because this one had a focusing helical that we designed because the large format lenses they don't have a focus ring on them when you put a large format lens on a camera, it, it's the bellows and you focus by moving the lens. Uh, the lens moves in and out and the bellows stretch as you move the lens in and out. And that's how it focuses. So when we were putting a typical four by five lens on this handheld camera, that's fixed with no bellows. So it just looks kind of like, a, it looks like a cone, basically it's a cone shape. So the the back of it is a four by five inch rectangle, and then it's a cone shape tapering down to a circle where the lens is. But we had to design a focusing helical to go onto the body of the camera, and that was all polycarbonate, and it was threaded, and it had to have a specific set amount of travel. Uh, we had to know like how much travel it had so that we knew what lenses worked with it and it had to have the focus points at the correct distance to the film plane and everything. Which, Anyways, long-winded way of saying this all got complicated in design and CAD and working out you know, CAD designs. And that particular design um, was a real challenge and was, you know, really got our feet wet uh, with OEM because we had to work with a lot of different manufacturers doing different parts. And we wound up doing, uh, working with manufacturers who are doing laser cutting um, and then making molds to bend the laser cut metal pieces. We were working with manufacturers who were doing chemical etching to make the uh, pinholes. We were working with manufacturers to do injection molding for all the molded parts. And on top of the helical being focusing, uh, it also had to be light tight. So all of our tolerances had to be just right or this thing wouldn't function. 
So anyways, <laughs> all of this was going on while I was freelance. My work was freelance photography at the same time. That was like my main uh, source of income. And then I started thinking of knife design because I had been learning CAD and I had been getting my feet wet with OEM and manufacturers. And I had been uh, looking at all these custom knives and everything. And we'd been assembling all of our parts together. And, uh, you know, so I was getting my feet wet with all of that kind of product design stuff and actually creating something from nothing. And so then I started thinking of, you know, I could maybe possibly like actually really do this knife design thing and maybe I can build some by hand in my own shop and maybe I can OEM some parts and pieces and whatever. And I wasn't sure, you know, but I sort of, it was a good kind of um, sort of little lesson before getting into knives and having, uh, you know, a little bit of this background in working these things out with other companies and OEM companies and stuff like that. I feel like it's definitely like um, it's a confidence booster when you work on a project like that, because then you can see your design sort of come to fruition as a physical object and it proves to yourself you're like okay i can do this like i right. can i can make these phone calls i can make this shit happen right and exactly. at the end of the day i can i can finish the sale and that's like i've right. i've just you've done the whole thing like that's exactly that's like the commercial aspect like yeah it's, it's exactly great. what it was and and so it was because it was exactly what you said because i had gone through all of it with that and in doing that it was with a business partner and so like whatever i kind of had trouble with or wasn't good at he kind of would take over and whatever he had trouble in it wasn't good at i would kind of take over but the fact that in the end we made it happen and we learned all of this then once i got past all of that and started to get into the knives i was like okay well now i know what to do and i know what i can work on you know to get better at and what I'm already good at and where I need to improve and whatever. So that's totally what it was for me. And I think with that stuff going on, it just kind of like in my mind made it seem a lot more possible to actually do knives myself, even though I had no background in metalworking or anything like that. Um, so, so I started playing, so I started playing with, uh, knife designs in CAD, I think starting around 2013, uh, late 2013, I think. And I, th oh, so that was the other thing. So because of this company where we were doing this camera stuff, that was the only reason I actually had a space, which also made it possible. So I'm living in Chicago, but I'm living in a condo um, that was small and was you know second story and i didn't have any kind of space to have like a shop or anything but because we had this side business doing the camera stuff uh we had a shop space and so i knew i could put aside a little corner in that shop space and put some stuff in there to try to tinker with knives in there and that was where i started uh trying to tinker with them so after making a few designs um I was like, okay, well, I have no money and I have no metal working tools. I, I literally did not even have a um, drill press. So I went out and I was like, well, I'll just go get a drill press and I'll get a small cheap grinder. And I bought a Ryobi drill press and I bought a uh, uh, Craftsman 2x42 grinder, which is a piece of shit. <laughs> nice, <laughs> there you go. He says this, but... But there, there's two types of noobs. There, there's the poor man's Harbor Freight noob, and then there's the rich man's Lowe's Ryobi semi new brands stuff. Ah, okay. There's there's a <laughs> delineation there. Okay. He, actually, he actually had the rich man's top tier stuff because his belt well, actually you know, I didn't even know of Grizzly. That was what you said was the Grizzly one? Was that the other no, one no, you no. said? I'm talking about that you went to Lowe's. The, 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 the low poor man's what I went. I went to Harbor Freight. Oh, Harbor and Freight, I, Harbor Freight. I had that I belt even that know. track and that drill press that was going to blow up any second. Like, yeah, the yeah. Ryobi, like at least it wasn't going to blow up every any yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off. Got it. You said, right, I'm sorry. You said um, Harbor Freight, and in my mind, I was thinking Grizzly. Um, at the time, I didn't even know of Harbor Freight or Grizzly. I literally, I, I, I mean, I literally had no idea of 
anywhere to get anything. Um, so I wound up with what the hardware store down the road had, which was the Ryobi drill press and uh, some place that had the sear or the, it might have been a Sears God, uh, that had the yeah that had the um the craftsman two by 42 um so that was what i wound up with and i mean i didn't even have uh i think i also bought which was almost a waste but uh, i also bought the little ryobi bandsaw which is a piece of junk the only thing it can cut is you know micarta and carbon fiber can't cut titanium or metal <clears throat> and uh i was like oh maybe it can i'll just buy it and see I'm like no it cannot <laughs> So <laughs> the, the design then to, fine. Yeah. So to cut titanium and metal, I had to I got a um it must have been cheaper. I bought a Ryobi uh sounds like a fucking Ryobi ad. I bought a Ryobi uh what is it? A metal cutoff what is it called? Oh like angle grinder. Saw? Angle grinder. grinder. Angle grinder. Oh, it's the worst trying to cut titanium with an angle grinder. That sounds like yeah. yeah that's, that's a, not that's a correct tool. Yeah, tires. How do you yeah. cut your lock bars? Angle grinder. <laughs> Fuck it. No, that's angle not grinder. It, no, almost. <laughs> but uh, no, that was how I chopped down the 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 you know the eight and a half by eleven sheets of titanium was with a fucking oh, okay. angle grinder. <laughs> it was shit. it was horrible. It was li- it was horrible. I do not recommend it. It's awful. It works. <laughs> yeah oh god yeah but it's awful because it it creates so much friction and so much heat then the titanium just wants to warp and go crazy um so it was a pain in the ass but that so that was what i started with though was literally that was what i used to cut the titanium um and the drill press and that craftsman 2x42 and i built the first the first frame lock i built was the wanderer and i built that uh in 2014 at the end of 2014 i think and uh that was those were the only tools that i had and to cut the lock bar i used uh the dremel cutoff wheel the dremel metal cutoff wheel uh in in the drill press i think that's a solid choice yeah Yeah. so i just had that in the drill press and then just had the uh the piece of titanium you know in a in a vice and then just moved it across Pretty standard method. I know, I know knife makers that have been doing it for twenty years, and they still use that method. Yeah, yeah. It, works it works. Better, you think it works? Yeah, it works. And and I did the same thing to cut the lock relief. I probably I didn't think of it a, a better way with what I had would have been to use the um, you know, I've seen it done before. It's too big, but some people will use like a small wheel on their grinder and just cut their lock relief that way. Yeah, I've done that. That was the first knife I ever made. I did that way, yeah. but it's pretty sloppy. It, yeah, it's. I mean, you could do it nice if you're careful, but it kind of you can tell that's what's done, and it's real big, and it you know it doesn't look great. But that's safer than putting an end mill and a Ryobi drill press. <laughs> There's a couple, which is what I did. Yeah. What? There's one or so two I, makers that do that. That's like their it's, signature. Yeah. yeah, you mean the 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 end mill and a drill press or the uh, grinder lock relief the lock relief the, oh yeah in the gr- with like the that. grinder yeah, yeah. Uh, i can't remember who i, I feel like i saw do that recently but really uh, maybe no his are his aren't that wide hmm. oh well, i guess if you were using a really small wheel but anyways uh i i yeah, I put a, I chucked up a end mill in the drill press, and that was terrifying because I was just waiting for it to come shooting out. But that was how I did the first uh, few yeah, um, bad, before yeah, I had a mill. You think. I quickly realized that mills yeah. couldn't be. I mean, drill presses couldn't be used as mills because chucks are designed to only have down force, not side load. So I had the bright exactly. idea to just see the chuck in place. That worked. <laughs> yeah. no, there was no more pull load. Oh, okay. So that was that was the Wanderer, and that was also the f- uh, the Feist was the same setup. Um, the very first Feist, which was uh, early 2015, and that was that same studio uh, with the cameras on the side. And so at the same time, I was doing the Wanderer, and I was doing the Feist builds, and we were still doing the camera builds uh, at this time. 
Um, and then that went through. So you 20... were you were still doing the camera project while yeah, sort of doing your side hustle photography gig while yeah working on a burgeoning uh, knife maker habit. Yes. So the knives were right. so the knives were like the were pushed back the farthest. So like my main income was photography uh work uh like assisting photographers and also shooting jobs. I did both. Um so uh cuz I was freelance. So there was a handful of people that I knew um that I liked working with that I would assist for a long time. I mean some of them you know, I even still would have assisted like a few years ago. And then also I would do, would shoot jobs as well. And then on the side of that being my main income, we were doing the camera thing and the camera thing, uh, we wanted to grow it a lot bigger and we were kind of trying to, and then, um, my business partner in that he had been freelance and didn't have a regular full-time job and he had kind of more time to spend on doing that and i was freelance as well so it sort of worked um but then he wound up getting a full-time job that kept him really busy and started flying him all over the world real early on in him taking that job and so um he was kind of available a little bit less and less and then i kind of started getting into the knives and the building and the designing of the knives more and more at the same time. Uh, so all of that was going on at once, <laughs> which was a lot. Um, and so the knives were kind of taking a little bit of a backseat and starting to come forward. Uh, and then he, he got that job uh, shortly after, well, we, we had this space going for a little while, a few years or something. Um, and I guess it was still during that time when we had that space that, uh, yeah, we I think we still had that space that I got in touch with um, Kaiser and we started talking about the collaboration of the Wanderer and the Feist. And that was in, I think, 2016 is when we started talking uh, on those collaborations. So that was still all going on. We hadn't quite left the studio and ended the fo the photo thing 100% yet. Um, it was probably getting close to being on the way out. And then the talks of the collaborations were starting. I'm like, I'm pretty surprised that um, you guys didn't uh, give that design or sell that design. That seems like a great Lomography thing. Like, I I'm really surprised they didn't. Oh, I swooped that up from you. Well, that's funny you say Lomography. We had we had lots of plans and lots of ideas. And Lomography was actually on our radar and in part of our thoughts and plans and ideas. And early on in our working on this stuff, uh, they had... I'm trying to remember how the timing worked out. Uh, I'm trying to think if we had it yet. I think we were working on we might have we might have been like in production but didn't have the pieces yet and Lomo opened a store in Chicago. And so we got in touch with the people running the shop here and we were kind of in touch with them for a while and hanging out with them and stuff like that. Um and they were aware of what we were doing and everything and we kind of had ideas in our head to do some collaborations and stuff like that with them. Um but the timing didn't work out and eventually that store shut down and it didn't, it, it lasted for a little bit, but it's not there anymore. Um, but we, we also went as far as to like, we, we had designs, we had a whole lot of designs, just like, you know, like knife makers have a ton of designs on to, the, you know, stashed away off on the side. I mean, we went as far as hiring a lens engineer out of Rochester, New York. And we actually had a, design for our own lens completely built i mean like we literally paid for an ex kodak guy who would now ran his own business to design a lens for us and we were going to manufacture our own uh 120 injection molded plastic camera with a plastic lens like lomography oh wow yeah okay you were just gonna straight up just be like all right we're yeah. just gonna do our own holga like yeah. fuck you yeah okay. i mean we were gonna do you know something different um yeah back when i was doing photography and pinhole you know a lot of it was holga uh well I, part of what 
got me started in uh, pinhole and alternative stuff was the Holga. When I was in high school and living in Florida before I moved to Col- uh, before I moved to Chicago, <clears throat> excuse me. When I was in high school, uh, I came to Chicago and went to the School of the Art Institute for their early college program. So what they do is students who are interested in going there can stay at the school in the dorms. I forget how long, if it's like one week or two weeks or something like that. And you take uh, all the college courses that you would take in your major or like for photo, you take, you know, the standard photo courses, whatever. So I was a high school student running around in Chicago, taking courses at the Art Institute and the photo instructor on the first day uh, brought out um, Holgas for everybody. And <clears throat> he wanted us all to shoot with Holgas. And we did the whole thing, the whole class and everything with Holgas. Cause you know, it's that whole thing of, it's not the camera, it's the person, right. you know? And no, I mean, that's what, when you put your hands on a Holga, that's like, that's a game changer. That's like your grizzly grinder. You're like, yeah. wait, I can do anything. Yeah. With yeah, this. yeah. Yeah. Like totally. all this garbage. Yep. I don't need any of this. Nope. Like yep. it's a crude yep. instrument, but yep. I can create things with it. Yep. And so I fell in love with it. What, uh, Absolutely fucking fell in love with it. Was it? Huh? Yeah. Was Holgas it? Are like, okay. So a Holga, a Holga is basically the most, it's like $25 <laughs> yeah. almost anywhere. And it's like basically a plastic, what they call yeah. them, Lamography calls them toy cameras. Yeah. So a Holga holds 120 120 film. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But it's 20 bucks. Yeah. So yeah. it's like a leaf shutter. Yep. It's fixed everything. Fuck off. It's just, yeah. you push you, the button, it takes the picture. Exactly. You manually wind it. You take another picture. Yep. Maybe it works. Maybe, maybe it works. It maybe doesn't. it doesn't. So it, it, yeah. Yeah. Jared got like a full hard on for like four days. Well, it's I just like I busted around. so many of those cameras. Like I went, you just you you just go through them because they just like break well, or they have problems or you so duct tape it so much. Yeah, that you want to know of the. Well, it's one of those things where it's like if anybody doesn't know it, it's injection molded. It's medium format, so it takes one twenty roll film. Now when you're advancing the film, there's nothing to stop you. You have to look in the window. Right. There's a little window in the back, and there's uh, the backing red paper. sheet of plastic yeah the backing paper of the film has the numbers so uh what that means is like as you're advancing the film you have to look at the numbers you have to stop at the right spot but the thing that's good and bad about that is if you're not paying attention you go too far you can go too little but then that's where it all gets creative because you can also bleed the images together do multiple exposures run the images together a little bit or a lot there's light leaks the back's not always fitting completely perfectly so there was it was one of those things where it's like all the fuck ups were beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. See, that seems like you so, get more like cool shit out of that than like a modern DSLR. Well, well they give, yeah. they give kids that. Cause they're like, look, y- you can't break it. It's practically yeah. already broken anyway. Just go have fun and enjoy photography before you're worried about right. like spending like 10 grand on a fucking camera. Yeah. That's the thing. You don't need to spend 10 yeah, grand on, one on B&H photo. Yeah, but I fell in love with those and I would buy those and I would take them apart. And what I would do is I would take the lens off of them and then I would put a pinhole on the front and I would have tons of them. So I'd have some with lenses. I'd have some without lenses. I would have pinholes, some with different size pinholes, some with black and white film, some with color film. I mean, I was always screwing around with those things. So yeah, we were thinking of going in that direction. Like I said, we went as far as having somebody design a lens for us and, uh, and even paid you know it was it's completely designed and we had started on the design for the camera body um but it never got finished and manufactured um so yeah everything just kind of fell apart we kind of went our separate ways he he took this full-time job started traveling around the world for his job um and then me and uh me and my wife and daughter moved um well had a kid then we moved out of the city into the suburbs and so now we're farther apart and we got rid of the studio space and so it all just kind of crumbled but we Mm. had uh we had big plans for it like lomo (laughs) right yeah because i i I found it on your instagram and i was like oh my god this like this looks like it was made by lomo like i mean if somebody really wants to like see all of it i don't think that kickstarter gets rid of anything it was called wanderlust cameras and if you i mean you can search wanderlust cameras and they're um the pen wide was our first product. And when we made it, it was the world's widest digital pinhole cap. 
And then the four by five camera was called the Wanderer. And uh, yeah, it was Wanderlust cameras. Cool. I kind of want to mess around with one of those. I remember when we first started talking, uh, I you were telling me about that and I thought it was like fascinating. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, I wish we could have taken it farther. I think part of what was hard for us was um, the was Kickstarter. Uh, I am not a fan of Kickstarter and I'm not afraid to say it. Um, I think that I, I here put it this way. We did it twice. We were quote unquote successful, quote unquote successful. Say that twice. Uh, And I would never do it again and I would never recommend it to anybody. That's just my own personal opinion on it. (laughs) I am currently in the process of fulfilling one. So (laughs) it's a nightmare. I, I, my thing is, I mean, well, you're doing, you're, you're making your own product and, I'm guessing you're talking about, I can't remember what you call it. The, the key thing, the COVID thing. Is that what you're talking about? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you have, I think two different things going for you is one, you're making it yourself and two, it's more or less a simple product. That's one single solid piece. We were excuse though, which was, that was the (laughs) mistake we were doing, uh, we were for this four by five camera, it was multiple pieces using OEM across three different manufacturers and three different States, maybe four. Um, and, uh, you know, it was all OEM with all these different places and we're doing injection molding and we had only done it once before. And when we did it once before, there was no interacting parts that had to go together and, So this was the first time that we had done anything with injection molding where parts not only had to go together, but parts also had to, the focusing helical had to spin and be light tight. And it was an absolute utter nightmare. So the reason that it all turned into a nightmare is because of that whole thing of when Kickstarter started, I believe it was a little more clear early on that when you were a backer for something like a product, you are not guaranteed the product. You're not paying to absolutely 100% get a product. What you're paying for is to support a creative person in their creative endeavor to try to make a product, and you're getting a behind-the-scenes view of what it takes and the process and what happens in the process, and there are risks that are listed, and it's possible for everything to go completely wrong in the manufacturing process and to run out of all the money and not end up having the product where the makers didn't do anything wrong and you don't end up with a product. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's building, it's building capital and you're, you're paving a runway with Kickstarter. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, but the thing is, the thing is that, that quote unquote backers really, it should be called backers all the time because it's different than a customer. They don't keep that in mind and they don't remember that they, they think that if they're paying and it's a product that they absolutely are supposed to get that product no matter what. And I've gotten to arguments with people about this and they're like, no, that's not the case. If it's a product, you know, you're supposed to get it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, that's not the way Kickstarter started up. That's not how it used to be. I don't know what they state now currently or how they word it. Um, But when we did the first one, Kickstarter was very, very young. Yeah. When we did the first one, Kickstarter was very, very young and it was clear that, you know, it was not a guarantee. So here's what happened. So basically, well, well, I mean, this isn't knives, but uh, with the the four by five camera, we ran into a lot of troubles because with injection molding of polycarbonate and whatever the mix was, it was a mix of polycarbonate and like nylon or something. And depending on how you make the mix, it can be either more flexible or more brittle. But that also changes the shrink rate depending on how how you mix it, and the shrink rate affects our focusing helical if it shrinks too much it's too tight and it won't spin and if it doesn't shrink you know you have to figure out the right balance so in trying to create this product and get the correct mix and the correct hold time in the mold and the correct temperatures in the mold and everything 
we blew through all of the money. And when we uh, put our goal amount, I I know we doubled it. I think we doubled. I think we asked for two and a half times what we thought we needed, and we surpassed that. And then we still blew through all of it. And it wasn't because we were doing anything wrong. It was because that's what it wound up taking. That's the reality of manufacturing. And but we still delivered because my business partner. We were like, well, we're not going to leave everyone hanging, even though technically we we haven't done anything wrong. We should be able to show everyone, well, this is what we've done. Everyone saw everything step by step. You know, that should be it. Instead, uh, he sold some Apple stock and put his own money in, and we finished the run and finished shipping all the parts. And then that was pretty much the end after that. Yeah, that. That can be a heartbreaker for, yeah. for a project like that. No, no matter how good everything is, if you get to the end and, and the creators are just kind of upset with the process, then the product probably dies in the process. Well, part of the problem is like we kind of would have been okay. I think the, the, so this is my problem with Kickstarter is, uh, like I said, I don't know what they say now. So, you know. Well, now that it's, it's very different because I always made a joke that Kickstarter – kind of it's it's almost illegal uh the whole space you can't really legally take a mass pre-order for items like that Mm -hmm. uh so they call it you're giving someone a donation and they're rewarding you right Uh, so the whole thing falls in legal like an illegal gray zone and it's all about the terminologies they use right and i've tried starting a business of not with a similar gray area premise about something else. So I was very familiar how they run, were running it back then. It wasn't really built, I don't think, for what you were saying, uh, but technically based on how the rules were, it was. But that wasn't really their goal. Uh, but their there was goal no was just to make back. money. <laughs> yeah, I just they were just like, like the lawyers. Like, how, you, how can we word this to make it okay? Yeah. And we're not liable. Now right. – I was surprised when I ran because I ran a Kickstarter about four years ago, uh, and now it didn't go so smoothly with some with some weird situations with a move. But I ended up fulfilling it. Uh, this one's going smoothly, but it was very different. Last time I did this, it was like, "What's your name? What's your email? And like a photo of your ID, and you're like, you're ready to go." Oh wow! Uh, this yeah, that's very asked, different. Yeah, this time it asked for my social, a credit mm-hmm. card for chargebacks. So mm-hmm. this time you could actually chargebacks which back then i did it four years ago you couldn't do chargebacks mm-hmm. like i run the way with money like that's it so they asked for credit cards for chargebacks asked for my social security and some other information but it, it was like it was a fill out this time around and then yeah. it took about a week to get verified even though i've done a project in the past yeah well so i'm very- glad it's working for you if it's working out um i mean we'll get off this because i feel like this is an ad for them but my my problem with them i'll just say that and we'll move on from them is um like they're, you know, they set up the platform and they are um, supplying this platform for people to do this thing. Well, I mean, that's all they got to do. They set up a platform and they have a shitload of people in an office sitting in New York. Why can't your people in New York give more support to the makers who are making you a shitload of money? They don't give the makers enough support and backing. And what I mean is like, if something starts to go wrong, the backers or customers will start to get crabby and they'll start to get frustrated and upset. And then what happens is they will all gang up. And when you're one person, like Nick is a one man, a one man shop. Well, him and his dad, two man shop. Well, I don't know how many backers he has, but let's just say he has 10,000 backers. Well, he's one person. If 10,000 people start jumping down his throat, you can't, individually reply to 10,000 people, right? And it's like they can they can be jumping down your throat for something that's not legitimate and what will happen is that those people will start complaining to Kickstarter and then <laughs> the employees at Kickstarter will start emailing you saying we're getting complaints about your project. It's like wait a minute, what the fuck? Why don't you look and see what's going on? You should be helping support us because all you're doing is providing this platform. You should have something in place where you have people that can help manage all of these um, backers who aren't understanding the way that this operates. Yeah, Anyways. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't disagree with you. And I feel like a lot of modern tech 
and modern social media is based off of exactly what you passed over. I don't know if you meant to, but basically we provide the platform and allow you to use it. Whereas I keep having conversations with people about this on Instagram and I'm like, you know, we are the people who create the content. Right. And therefore we are the people creating the content that you are selling other users, your ads to. So you're allowing us to use the platform, but like, you're not, you're just yelling at us when we do the wrong thing and right. there's no support for doing the right thing. It's right. This, it's this similar thing to what you're talking about, which is yes. just like, look, you, you know, you're making money off of the things that we do. Right. And we have no support other than just to be told right. that we're wrong. Exactly. Like, exactly. It, it's kind of BS. It's yeah. It's totally Politics. frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, enough bit. of Kickstarter. <laughs> okay. Right. So let's, all right. So let's, let's, let's jump back. Yeah, so really. you, were, you were talking about your, your Kaiser collaborations. Yeah, so that started, um, I believe, around 2016 um, is when we started talking, and I think um, I think the knives came out in 2017. So I guess I can talk about how that came about. Lots of people who uh, message me privately or seem interested sometimes. Um. So I'm friends with Matt Degnan, who's a knife maker who some of you may know of, may not know of. He's not uh he's not super active in building customs right now, but he still does some collaborations. Um his last collaborations were with um Drop and uh Yeah, you kind of see him pop up here and there in the last few years, but uh, he, yeah. he used to be very popular back in the US days, I remember. Yeah, he's cool. He dude. did he did he, uh, he's, messaged he, me way back. Yeah, he did a collaboration with Drop, and he also did a collaboration with Wii not too long ago, um, all, right around the same time. Um, so he has one with Wii right now that's out. That was, uh, I guess, middle of this past year or came out. I don't know. Anyways, so Matt Matt Degnan is friends with, I don't know how to say his last name, but Matt Kuchihari. How do you say his name? Matt Kuchihara. Kuchihara, yeah. So Matt Degnan is friends with him. Well, Matt Cucciera, however you say it. Sorry, guys. I'll call him Matt C and Matt D. <laughs> so Matt C uh, was in touch with Kaiser and started doing some collaborations with Kaiser. And if I understand correctly, back when he started talking with Kaiser about his collaborations, I believe that Matt Degnan told me that he actually went to China and went to see Kaiser and kind of go over different things that they should shift to different things that they should do different things that they should think about as far as their materials and their manufacturing and whatever um for this market to for it to be more appealing to this market the american market and other markets and whatever um just to you know make it more appealing to everybody um and so they had a really good partnership and they did a whole bunch of his knives um, back then at that time, a lot of different models. And so Matt C got Matt Degnan in touch with Kaiser and Matt Degnan had uh, a couple of designs right off the bat. The Kane uh, was the first one, I believe the Kane model K A N E. <clears throat> and they did a few models with him and I had been in constant contact with Matt. He's like, Hey, we're doing this stuff with Kaiser. You know, they're starting to, look for a lot of new makers and everything. You should reach out to them. So he got me in touch with Kaiser and I was like, there's no way that Kaiser is going to, you know, want any of my stuff. I'm a nobody. I'm just starting out. I'm just, you know, I've I had just built one Wanderer and one Feist. I'm like, there's no way, you know, cause back in the day it was like manufacturing companies only worked with known makers who are big time makers who had, you know, been doing it as a career for like a decade or something. That was kind of how I thought of it anyways. <clears throat> and um, But I was like, oh, well, fuck it. I got nothing to lose. Um, so I sent them an email with the contact that Matt Degnan hooked me up with and sent them the Wanderer files and the Feist files. And they said yes to both of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was exciting. I mean, I, like I said, I literally had only built one proto of each one. And then after that was pretty much right after that was talking to them about the collaboration on them. 
so that that started that relationship with Kaiser. Um and it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think we uh, got into Kaiser like pretty much right around the same time. You were just a, a little uh ahead of me on that. Mm-hmm. Yep, I, I do believe. Wait, what was your? F- I'm trying to remember. What was the first one? Oh, it was um, good company. Uh, what? What was your first one, For me? Elijah? Yeah, uh, the uh, Mega Ethereum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I couldn't remember the name. That's what I thought it was. And was that the one yep. that was um, uh, was that the same one that that maker had built one or two customs of that disappeared on everybody? Or was that a different model? Yeah, um, Alex Dietz. Yes, yeah, yes. Same, was that same the same model. one? Yeah, okay, I remember he, uh, that back when he, he was making like that. A, yeah, he made like a couple prototypes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And kind of like flaked and just kind of took off, disappeared. But yeah. Yeah, same model. Yeah, fuck that hmm. guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Anyways, I back on. That would be a lot of money, Elijah. Back on topic. <laughs> Yeah, well, so so those were the first two with Kaiser, and that was kind of I'm trying to think. That was kind of all it was for a little bit with Kaiser. Um, uh, and then Elijah had his with Kaiser, and then at some point, I don't know how much longer it was after that that Elijah started working with We, and um, I was like, oh, I gotta get you know something with We, and I kind of waited for a really long time because. I didn't want to get a no. <laughs> I didn't want to. Yeah. I didn't want to send them something. I didn't want to rush and be like, Oh, I have a design and be kind of like hemming a high about and like, not sure. And then send it and then get a no. I wanted to wait until I felt like I had a design. Um, actually, that's really funny. This is it just made me think of something funny related to the first design. So I wanted to have something that I felt really, really, really confident with. Um, so it took me a while and before I reached out to them and then the f- first design that I sent them was the angst, the first design I sent to we, and I don't know what year that was, but well, it was probably only about a year ago because it usually takes about a year. Um, and so in between those two things in between the first stuff with Kaiser and the angst would have been the baby Barlow. Um, okay, so the the angst. Okay, and just just for the just for the total record, the angst is the new yes. the the dagger that you just put out. Yes. Okay. All right. So that was Which the first I have design the prototype. Yes. So that was the first design that I right sent here. to to we. And so the funny thing with that one is, uh, I don't. Some people may or may not know. Um, that one kind of started out as a joke a little bit. So a friend of mine, he hates daggers. He like loathes them. He can't stand them. And I was sitting down to start working on a new design. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to, I don't know why, I, you know, just like poking at people and just fucking with them. I was like, I'm going to make a dagger design and just make it kind of, kind of goofy, but almost serious and tell him, it, you know, be real serious about it and tell him that this is the next design I'm working on and see what he says, just to kind of fuck with him. And, uh, <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, Patrick, uh, what is he? Sharp Dad and some number on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Sharp Dad. He's always giving other. you shit. Yeah. He loves to give me shit. So that's why I was going to give him shit. Yeah. So anybody who knows that guy, go give him some shit. <laughs> if anybody just sees just him giving me shit on my feeds, he's just giving me shit because he knows me and he thinks it's funny. Um. But yeah, so I was doing it as a joke, but then it started to come together really well. And I was like, wait a minute, I actually really like this. I'm like, fuck that. This isn't a joke anymore. This is serious. <laughs> and <laughs> so I set that aside. Yeah. So I set that aside and then I got serious about it. And I was like, this shit's all just coming together. I really like this. And I kept working on it, kept working on it. I'm like, fuck, this is like, I'm really digging this. And uh, once I got into the 3D, the 3D modeling after doing the 2D, once I got into the 3D extrusions and everything and doing the inlays, I was like, fuck, I think this is the one I'm going to send to Wii. 
And once I got the 3D stuff complete, I was like, yeah, I think this is the one I'm going to send. And so that was the first one. Hmm. Yeah, the daggers, that's a that's a cool little knife. I, I, I like that. Yeah, they, um, they did a great job with it. So that and the baby Barlow share like some pretty direct design um, features. Is that really? I mean, that's obviously intentional or, or is it just well, I'm that's surprised like, you say that. Well, because. Well, sometimes I like to point things out and sometimes I don't like to point things out. <laughs> okay. So enough. I'll okay. go ahead. No, no. So I'll go ahead and point out the. Well, I mean, it's all design language. Like, there's no reason right. that it shouldn't have the same design language, right? So, <clears throat> the um, the angst is very similar to the feist in that the handle shape is wider at the front and narrower at the back, and you know, kind of the very uh, simple contouring and stuff like that, and the very kind of straight, you know. Uh, you know, straight sleek lines instead of like huge curves or whatever. Um, so to me, it shares a lot of design language with the feist, hmm. the, uh, the angst, um, as far as the, Oh, well you, you're talking about the inlays. I guess I'm thinking of just like the naked profile. Yeah. So like the baby Barlow and, and, and the dagger both have that sort of, which yes. I now recognize as your sort of signature, yes. like inlay, like little extruded thing. pivot collar thing. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I dig it. I love yeah, it. Cause it then it shows too. up on the OSS dagger. Like right. Yeah. So you know, that, so it's very industrial design stuff is so fucking hard because <laughs> <laughs> just get into it. Just lay Everybody's into it. Everybody's done it. Here's <laughs> the thing. Okay. I, I was going back and forth whether or not to mention it, but this isn't a, a perfect example. You know, it's like you do something, you, you start working on something. Eli, well, Elijah's design language is so different. He probably doesn't have this problem, but you, you start working on something, you get 80% of the way there. You take a break, you go look at Instagram and you fuck that's it right there like that fuck <laughs> that's the knife i was just designing i have to go scrap it and start over and you know do something completely different so um when when i came up with that you know sort of um pivot collar thing with the five grooves um lots of people were doing pivot collars and more and more pivot collars and now it's just kind of a standard everyone has a pivot collar but back when i came up with that not as many people were doing pivot collars. It was getting more and more popular. And I was like, man, I like them, but damn it. It's like, I don't want to have the same exact thing. I want to have something that's a little bit kind of stands out as mine. So I was trying to figure out, you know, how to do something that could kind of stand out and be similar, but be different. So I was like, take a pivot collar and make it a different shape. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So that I took works. a pivot collar and I made it a slot. <laughs> and then, um, you know, put the five grooves in it. And I was like, okay, this is working for me. Um, and so that, that kind of became a little sort of design motif for me to use and go back to. And, um, you know, that kind of stands out as mine. Um, and, and so I'm really happy that I kind of have that to use in my designs. Um, but it's not in every single design. It's in some of them, but not all of them. Well, I dig it. I, I really like it. I gotta say, I, th I think it's a uh, it's it's good for the thumbs and it's great for the eyes, and uh, I, I really I, I see that and it's immediately recognizable. Yeah, um, yeah, and I like that yours. it's got different. You know, I can play with it different ways. So, like on the angst, on the angst, you know, it's an inlay with the grooves cut down into it. But on the um, on the OSS dagger, which I was so glad that we said yes. I wasn't sure if they'd say yes to this um weird um construction um instead of grooves going down it's actually g10 coming up through the steel and so that now they're raised in a little recessed area um and we did awesome with those um and then also, i have a way to go to bring back the um the thumb dagger i feel like that's <laughs> a hugely overlooked part of the market i yeah. mean i don't you know so, it's just it's a neat edc item i think so th there's okay so there's two things so one like i wasn't going to bring it up but um you know i was just talking about like you you make a design and then you look on instagram and then you see it and you're like oh fuck i gotta start over so that just happened to me today so we're talking about the daggers right so i did this the dagger with the the angst 
And then, um, and that was the first dagger I'd ever had ever done. And then um, I did the the OSS dagger, and then another knife um, with we that's coming out is the Black Void Opus, which is a chisel grind. So I'd had daggers and chisel grinds on my mind, and I was talking to somebody like one or two months ago, and I was like, you know, it'd be crazy, a chisel grind dagger. Fucking Stout just posted today a chisel grind I, dagger. I, I saw that. I was like, that's pretty dope, really? actually. Yeah. I I was <laughs> literally I talking to somebody so about old. that. I was literally talking to somebody about that two months ago. And I was like, I've never seen this anywhere. Uh, I have to go do this. I got to get out and go do a chisel grind dagger. And I'm like, don't mention this to anybody. Don't say anything. Don't, don't say it. Don't put it into Google. <laughs> Someone's going to steal that idea. And I didn't get into the shop. I'm pretty sure John Gray... <laughs> He's Has done he done one? Probably like 20 years ago. He's oh, done somebody's time. probably it's done possible. it. Somebody's probably done it. I mean, it's kind of like it's kind of like 90 percent of the stuff you can think of, Michael Walker's done. I mean, I mean, that is unique as hell. And if you put that into a folder, then that's even better. Yeah. I yeah. anyways, I didn't I didn't get to it before him, but that kind of thing happens all the time. And the other thing that I thought was funny where the same thing happened was the OSS dagger. So I designed the OSS dagger. Uh it didn't show anybody, sent it to we. Uh well, I probably showed um Elijah. We show each other stuff. Um I did see it. No, yeah. I did show it because yeah, because he caught this. So I showed it to Elijah while I was in design. I think I, I said, I think I'm gonna send this to We, blah, blah, blah. You know, we chatted about it, whatever. Send it to We. We says yes. Um so then we go through the, um, you know, the whole process of prototyping and whatever, blah blah blah. Well, then uh, I get a text from Elijah. He sends me a picture from Instagram, and he's like, "What the fuck?" And it's a thumb dagger from Workerman. Who? Yeah, I was going to see if we're going to mention that because I thought that's, yeah. that's what you're bring up and not stout. I was like, because I saw those kind of come up together. Yeah, and I also had some work design for one that was just kind of in the works at that time. I was like, oh well, never mind. It's it's done. I'm, I'm quitting that one as well. <laughs> So Workerman, um, and nothing against Workerman, he's a great guy. We 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 chatted, we had chatted uh, long ago, and we actually had talked about working on a design together, and things fell apart, and then uh, and then we hadn't talked for a while. He kind of ghosted me for a little while, and then uh, then the thumb dagger thing came up, but he hadn't seen mine, and I hadn't seen his, but he posted um, a 3D CAD of the thumb dagger, and I was like, shit. No one's seen mine because I was keeping it under wraps, but I w- mine was already physically in production when nobody had seen it and people were seeing his CAD. So shortly after he showed his CAD, then I got my physical prototypes and then, you know, people were confused. They're like, wait a minute, this guy's copying that guy. And I'm like, no, dude, these are physical prototypes. There's no way I can have a physical prototype from a manufacturer like one week after he posted just a CAD render. Of course <laughs> like, you can. Try the magic. Yeah. You can so, do that, but it's real hard. <laughs> yeah. So it happens. I mean, people, you know, people have similar ideas and work on similar stuff without, you know, without knowing it or intending it or whatever. It happens. And you know, I mean, I mean there's a couple times. Yeah, I mean, there's no hard feelings with worker men. I th- I think we're we're fine, you know. But, um, but yeah, it happens. It can be difficult. It can be frustrating. Um, you know, sometimes it's more of an issue. Sometimes it's not an issue. Like I don't think this is an issue. Um, but it is what it is. Hmm. He's a good guy. I, I still see, I was I, I was still totally unaware to, of that account in general. So. Oh yeah, he's he has a huge following. He makes a lot of stuff. I mean, he makes mostly just like friction folders and little, sometimes little fixed blade, some little fixed blade like scalpel type things and um, a lot of cool resin based stuff. Yeah, lots of resin based stuff. Well, that and sometimes stuff he, makes, that he makes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. he does really good stuff. I mean, he's a, he's an excellent designer. Um, and from all the times I've talked to him, he's a nice guy. I've got no hard feelings, and hopefully someday we'll do a collaboration. Hmm. Interesting. All right. But the baby Barlow, yeah, so that one did get um, that same kind of uh, pivot collar inlay thing. Um, and that was a collaboration with uh, me and Urban EDC working together and then doing the baby Barlow as an OEM. Um, 
and I just sent them some new files. We are, I probably, I guess it's okay to say, uh, let the cat out of the bag. We're working on the second version, um, which is going to have a new blade profile that no one has seen yet. And the second one will be, well, I guess it's the third one. Um, G10 handles instead of, or G10 and carbon fiber in different combinations instead of titanium. Hmm. So that's an exclusive for Urban EDC? Yeah. Well, wait, I should, okay, that started out as an exclusive. I actually got a lot of shit for this once, um, a little while back, um, because it did start out as an exclusive, and it legitimately was exclusive, and we legitimately had initially planned on it being exclusive to Urban EDC from the beginning, the whole thing, that that whole design. Um, and then shortly after getting them and beginning to sell them, uh, we both realized kind of at the same time, and I was sort of waiting to see if he was going to realize it and say something or not. I didn't say anything. He came to me and he was like, you know, maybe we should be selling this to other retailers because then we can spread it around, you know, like some people might know of Blade HQ, but they don't know of Urban EDC. And at the same time, if you open up to a dealer in another country, you can make one shipment of, you know, 30 knives and then they can distribute it to people in that country instead of you making 30 international shipments. So, Exclusives are strange like that. Like, you think yeah, that's what it's I a do great now. idea, but sometimes yeah. it's, I don't know. I, I think I've it depends on how you work it. it. I think yeah. it depends on how you work it. There's different ways. So, like, so, so it's, it's exclusive in that me and Urban EDC, oh, we like, OEM that design like they OEM that does it's a collaboration between me and urban EDC as if I was collaborating with Kaiser right does that make sense yeah no I'm, I'm yeah so yeah, it's I like my it's, collaboration it's... with urban EDC and they OEM right. it um, yeah. and so it was exclusive and now we're open to a few retailers and so the retailers are blade HQ um, I think it's called knives and tools in the UK and uh, I think it's just those three right now but the other, you know, the other way that people do the exclusives that I think maybe kind of works a little bit better. I mean, this way works fine. What we're doing right now, currently, this current situation that we're doing with Urban EDC works. But um, like when um, these Feist exclusives started, that was sort of a new thing for Kaiser. I think I don't think they had done it too much before that, where you know, they would do an exclusive for a dealer. Um, and I think that Kaiser really, really, really likes that a lot because they know they're going to get all of these units that they're making out of Micarta are sold to this company. They're already paid for and gone. So it's like they know that they're going to be gone. Um, it's not like they're just making, you know, 500 titanium units and then they're trying to sell it to you know different retailers and some retailers are going to buy and some aren't it's like they know it's sold everybody does really enjoy pre-sold product just yeah. for the record that's <laughs> anytime it's pre-sold people are like that's great awesome I'm like okay great so i think Much easier i think the shops like it because they know that you know the customers have to go to that shop to get that version and i think that the manufacturer likes the way that works so I think those Feist exclusives um, are making both parties happy as far as those go. Good. So what's tell us, um, I have a question. What's up with the Black Void Opus? Like I handled that at SHOT Show and I was like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> like seeing it on Instagram, I was like, it looks pretty cool. But then like it's I like went Justin, with Elijah Justin to the booth. The scene beyond the veil. Yeah. And I was like, oh, all right. Like you're definitely working on like a level that. I hadn't seen from your previous work and that's not a negative thing. I just, yeah, yeah. I, I was like, totally like, okay, I'm not a huge manual knife kind of guy, obviously, but like, that was like, that's pretty neat. I a huge it. what knife? I, did, I missed that part. A huge what knife kind of guy? I'm not huge into like manual knives. I like knives with springs oh, in them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You like some things well, with springs in them, yeah. <laughs> them yeah, yeah, yeah. things. But like that that knife in particular, I was like, okay, this is this is pretty, this is pretty nuts. Like, what's what's the deal? Where is it? What's going on? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, well, it's a very next disappointing question. answer. So, <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's the most asked question, and unfortunately, yeah. I don't have a good answer. Um, I can tell why I don't. I, so the thing is, 
I don't really harp on the manufacturers to give me set times of when stuff is going to hit because for one they normally don't give you a set time they give you a rough idea and for another it's never the time they say and i don't blame them for it because it's just fucking manufacturing it's the way manufacturing goes in manufacturing there is always delays there is always delays there is always delays there is always delays it's inevitable there are always fucking delays if you're expecting there to be no delays you're going to be disappointed. You're making a mistake to expect there will be no delays. <laughs> See, we're coming full circle now because, right, because your early experience with yep. trying to manufacture something, you're yep. like, okay. I learned my point. lesson in the early manufacturing. Yeah. So I always expect delays, 100%. And right. so I don't harp on them for dates. Now, here's the other thing. Like, I kind of, previous to the COVID thing, it was like, it's nice to have like a rough month or whatever. But then this COVID thing happened and it's like everything is up in the air. Some people say stuff is shipping. Two weeks later, you hear that it's not shipping. You hear there's all these shipping problems. It's like it, there's no point in me hassling them right now because sure. shipping is so shitty right now. So, I mean, the um, it's in the oven. It's cooking. It's on the way. Yeah. At some point, it will be here in the future. So it is in the works. And um, all the prototyping, everything was already done, already approved. Um, I assume that they've already been working on the production of it, but I don't know when it's due. I was, yeah, I don't know when it's due. I mean, it had this COVID thing not hit. I mean, that probably delayed stuff a little bit as well. Um, mm. If not for, I, if, it, I mean, maybe not in production, but it might have just kind of pushed back a little bit of shipping stuff. So I don't know. Yeah. All right. That's fine. Whatever. It's going to happen. That's, but yeah, that that's design, a, I definitely was um, really happy with how that design came out. I, I, that design, I was looking back um, in my Instagram feed and the, the initial th- sort of um, key elements of that design started like four years Wait, how many years ago? Probably uh, maybe like five years ago or something. I can't remember. Um, Like five years ago. Yeah, I think it was five years ago I started on a design that had the flipper, the front flipper tab in that position and that shape. And the knife was shaped a little bit differently. um, And I had some water jet blanks cut out of the original profile and shape um that and i was going to prototype the knife and the the size was just too big and i could never quite get the size right and every time i tried to scale it down and shrink it down then the lockup and geometry didn't work and it just wasn't working and i struggled screwing with that design for a couple years on and off and then finally i was like all right i just have to like completely start fresh but take these one or two elements that i like and just start over and then the black void opus came out. <laughs> so yeah, the details in that thing are pretty incredible. Oh yeah. So I was, uh, that was another one where it was like, um, once I got the profile to where I wanted it, which is just the outline, you know, the look of the outline, the silhouette. Um, once I got that done, I don't remember how I thought, to play with um, the internal milling, but because I don't think I had the name yet. Um, I just wanted, I was starting to do some shaping and stuff. And it was one of those times where I was like, I want to do something that's a little different. That's, you know, not exactly the same as everything. And it's like, what can I do? And sometimes, you know, you can go too far and it's like, you look like you're trying to do something different and you throw 10 different things at it. And it just looks like a hot mess. Um, and then sometimes you come up with an idea. (laughs) No, yours works. Uh, and then sometimes you come up with, you know, stuff that works. And so, uh, scrolling around, orbiting around in the 3d at some point, I think, I think what it was is I was trying to work out the shaping on the outside and I still struggle with CAD because I'm self-taught and, uh, I still, I'm only scratching the surface of, you know, Fusion 360 and how to use it. So uh, 
you know, I'm working on trying to get the shapes that I want on the outside and spinning it around and orbiting through and whatever. And I'm like, God, the inside is so boring. You know, it's just the flat slabs. Like even if you shape the outside of the knife, the inside remains two flat slabs. It's, it's never shaped. So I was like, fuck it. Like if I run the internal milling out off the edge, then I can have the inside start to be shaped just like the outside is shaped. And then it's more like instead of a flat slab of metal, it's a wavy piece of metal that was never flat, you know? Questions like that are always the coolest to ask, I think. Yeah. So I start playing with that. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, well, what if, you know? And I ran it. So I started doing the internal milling and, uh, or internal pocketing. Uh, in the CAD and ran it off the edge. And I was like, oh shit, there we go. That's what I got to go with. (laughs) And um, so the blade was still just a normal double ground. I hadn't thought of the chisel yet. And I was just starting to work on the internal mount. So anyone who hasn't seen it yet, the Black Void Opus, if you go in the Instagram feed and you go back and look for the Black Void Opus, it's in there. Look for the videos and the shots where you can see the butt end of the knife and instead of the insides of the knife being flat they're contoured um so i was playing with the voids and so then i was playing with names and black void opus and then when i was playing around with the blade i wound up giving it the chisel grind and so there was no grind on the front and to me that just kind of like continued the theme of the void there was no grind on the front it was void of a grind and to me i had never really been honestly a huge fan of chisel grinds but as soon as i put it on there in the 3d cat i was like oh fuck that's gonna be a chisel grind <laughs> i was like that's that's gonna stay that's what it's gonna be and honestly <clears throat> um that the response was so funny well for one i wasn't totally sure if uh we would go for the chisel grind or not um i had i had no idea if they would be like oh this is too crazy like customers aren't going to want this or if they would be like we haven't done this so we like it because it's you know something we haven't done um the customer response to like photos and videos and whatever was crazy because so many people were so confused they when they just see totally them, bewildered by the design completely confused by i so when it's closed you know everyone is so hung up on is it centered is it centered collector centering I'm like it's a chisel grind it's not centered it the, the blade is centered but it's a chisel grind there's only a grind on one side so when you look at it in the closed position that it, you know it looks like it's off to the side and people couldn't wrap their head around this chisel grind. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought people knew what a chisel grind was. How is this so confusing to so many people? Um, I don't, people, I don't uh, think people know what a chisel is half the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I oh, think geez. most people understand chisel grind and then have never actually seen a carpenter's chisel. So they <laughs> like don't make don't the chisel. association. They're just like, yeah, of course, a chisel. And I'm like, do you actually know what a chisel is? And it's like, yeah, like a I, chisel. And I'm like, yeah. okay, forget it. Like, I was completely okay. shocked. I was, I was completely shocked so i can't remember what it was i thought that they would be confused by but what they were confused by was um they thought that it looked off center and well so here's the thing i'll say also uh since we're talking about this not only does it look off center to people who you know haven't seen this before to make matters worse the spine is not the same on both sides either. So that makes it even more confusing. If the spine were, yes, if the spine were symmetrical on both sides, in the closed position, if you're looking just at the tip and you're looking at the butt of the knife, that would look off. But then if you look down at the spine and how it relates to the two flat slabs inside of the knife, then you would be like, oh, it is centered. Well, <laughs> my flat slabs are no longer flat because I contoured the insides and ran them off the edges. And the spine of the knife is asymmetrical because on one side, it's a small chamfer. And on the other side, it's uh, 
what is it? Uh, no, it's a swedge. So everything on that is completely messing with your eye when it's in the closed position. And that's a like lot of why I like it. Yeah. Like I try to play with construction methods and stuff a lot of times. And I love how the fact mm-hmm. that you designed a knife around like the, like playing with perspective. Yeah, totally. Which is that's, pretty unique, I think. Yeah. I, th- I don't know. I know what you're saying, but I don't think I even thought of it that way. And I don't think I could have even thought to think of it that way, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, like it's all based around that idea, which is awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. like all kind of just messes with your head. It's like yeah. you're, you're telling people that they have to let that go. It's like collector centering and this and that and centered and like alignment. Like you just kind of have to let it go with this one. Yeah. The thing <laughs> is like, I understand people want the knife to be centered and this, that and the other, but like, with this knife when you're looking at it closed forget about quote unquote collector centering because the blade can be centered and it will look fucking whack but i don't think it looks whack in a bad way i think it looks fucking awesome (laughs) yeah and i guess in a sense it's probably more centered being a chisel grave Mm -hmm. i don't know i like the mind fuck of uh chisel grave Mm-hmm. yeah well you just look at the next time you look at it look at a spine shot too and you'll see like i mean i have two videos too and the funny thing is i put in one or two of the videos i put a, a description written under the video and i'm talking in the video and then i still had questions typed under the post that were covered in the written description and in me talking in the video <laughs> Hey man, I made a knife called the Pod, and I made about four hundred of those. And I had two unique emails, pretty much the same email. Two different clients bought it, and they were like, "Hey, I got this Pod thing, and I love it. It's essentially a two-inch friction folder." And they both thought the knife wasn't finished because it's round on one side. It, right, it's right, sharp. Right. It's like, hey, it's sharp. one side's not sharp. <laughs> the knife there guy like the whole i don't know if you've seen it but like yeah, the, yeah i've the, seen it yeah it, it dovetails in the edge like yeah there's a reason it was chisel ground so i like dude like where do you want me to keep grinding that thing <laughs> but i was like perplexed to myself i was like what like oh what i love you it. Up, man. You like, I made messed it, it up when you make some that that quantity yeah you get some unique messages when you start like getting like three it was like 350 units or something yep. like that and I was like, really, guy? Really? And it happened twice. I was like, really, guy? That's hilarious. Yeah. I was like, I'm like, I'm like oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I still got to grind it down to nothing. <laughs> well, I'm always surprised. It's like, how do you have that comment? Like, how did you buy it and then still have that comment or thought? Like, how did you not know that before you bought it? Do you know what yeah, I mean? It's not like a $6, like, oh, I'll just throw that in my Amazon cart. It's yeah. Like- right. I which I'm know. actually doing at the moment. That's part of the thing that's hard is, you know, this, um, uh, you know, everything turning over so fast, so fast, you know, every, this immediacy, everybody wants everything so quick, so quick, so quick. And the attention span is so short. Everybody's ADD, ADD, you know, it's just like everything flying by so fast. It's like, it's people, they miss details real easily. And it's also like, yeah, no, I, I see that a lot. Yeah. I think about it too in terms of designing like uh how f- like how many designs come out each year is just crazy. And then how fast the new design is old, it's just crazy. That's why I've cut back, you know, quality over quantity. Yeah. Well, I I mean I agree. I think so as well. Um I don't think of it in terms as like me trying to keep up with that. I'm always just amazed in terms of, you know, the mass mentality of this just kind of ADD, you know, the way that we've all gotten more ADD than years, many, many years ago. I mean, there's also, so I think from, from a different perspective, I think there's two sides to to some of that or, or to some of those coins, which is, Nick and I were talking about this um, earlier today, but essentially like we're also and not for the worst, but we're we're also teaching collectors 
and the market how to better uh hence to say emphasize but like to look at knives under jewelers loops Mm -hmm. you know and really understand the process of manufacturing and machining yeah to the point where like not that we as an industry would want to go back but just that everybody has become so retentive about every you know minutia of the knife that it's just to a point they apply that to every product at any price at any level and and i I honestly feel like at some point it's it becomes a little ridiculous because oh just no it does <laughs> I, like i deal with emails and people are asking questions and i'm like look dude like this knife that you're purchasing like doesn't apply to these you yes. know yeah but the laws of, of that reality don't apply to this knife 100 like, percent. it's 100%. totally different yeah like it doesn't you know it's in a like different universe a little bit more like because we talked about i want to see what what they think about this so the reason we i brought up the whole thing with the loop is uh i'm working on a project where it's like another one of my production projects and i'm like where do i want to how much work do i want to put into it whatever i want to price it as i'm working on it it's going to be in the mid hundreds to 200 dollar range uh but i was like i could make a version of this for under 100 bucks uh, yeah, start removing some of the finer details of it. Some of these unique chamfers uh, run the tools three times faster where the finishes aren't as pristine. But I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that. Like I can. And it hits a whole entirely different market when you get under this $100 price point. Right. Uh, but do I want to do that? I don't I don't know if that's good for the NCC last brand being that I generally make $1,000 customs. Right. Uh, and the whole jewelers loop is like, oh, but like, what's the difference? I'm like, well... On this, it's it's a fixed blade, but like I'm holding two tenths tolerances on the holes, which are like pit, folder pivot tolerances. He's like, well, why do you need to do that? It's a fixed blade. I'm like, well, when I do operation two and I flip them over, uh, all, if my hole tolerances are, are on the money, yeah, that means when I flip them over, the positional accuracy is on the money, right? And like the little thousands chamfers are perfect, and like right. I'll show you many examples that shows where you you the chamfers from side to side are usually for the most part, it happens on mine's one. Like it happens on my stuff too. I try to the best to keep everything in spec yeah. within the fixture tolerances for it not to happen. And you'll see a bigger chamfer on one side, a smaller chamfer on the other side, or like a cockeye chamfer, stuff like that, where I try to avoid it, or I could not, I could care less, a little bit less about it, and not try to hold two tenths tolerances on a fixed blade hole. Yeah, yeah, and just run through it. And those are the things where we brought the jewelers loop. I'm like, I think the type of collector now is a little bit more different. They're starting to notice things a little bit more when the guys are starting to slack and just like, just bust it out. Well, these are the kind of thing that uh, I think you guys could have a two hour conversation about just this. So like um, Jeremiah was saying that, you know, th- customers are um, more knowledgeable now basically is what you're saying right and so they're kind of taking their knowledge that they have and they're looking at things with a loop well the flip of it is they ha- they have like s- a certain amount of things either that they do know or that they think they know that they're looking at everything with a loop but things like what nick's talking about people don't actually know and they don't actually have a clue and it's all those little things that add up that make huge price differences, which goes to the whole argument of USA versus China and that whole debate of the pricing difference. So exactly what Nick is describing with holding his tolerances super tight so that his chamfers can be perfect on both sides. Well, the reason that that I can do things... Um, on the angst with like all these inlays and everything and the price is under $200 is because it's being made in China and their manufacturing, you know, their, their pricing is much more affordable than the U S I would love to make it in the U S but if you're doing a knife like the angst, which has, um, ah, God, I don't even know how many times it has to go on and off of the machine. It has to go on and off of the machine multiple times because you're pocketing the inside, but you're also pocketing the outside. But when you pocket the outside, you have to inlay the inlays in, but the scales aren't final machined yet because they have to be epoxied in first. Then it goes back on, it gets final machine. I mean, it goes on and off, on and off, on and off. And there's all these parts and pieces to it. 
and then the blade has four different grinds on it and it's $150. Now, when you come to the US and you want to have somebody do all that kind of manufacturing and hold tolerances like what Nick's talking about, it's four times the cost. And people, you know, they have certain things that they do know that they're more aware of in this business than what they used to be aware of five years ago, but there's still a whole lot that they aren't aware of, which are the things that Nick's talking about. And the lack of understanding for those things, I think, is where what drives those people to bitch and complain about the pricing. Because, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, it's it's things like that that they don't know and that they don't think about. Well, for me, it's it's not that. Well, it's that, but at the moment, I'm at the dumb lo- dilemma of, like, where do I want to – how do I want to make this product? Uh, I have the means to do production to, like, a larger scale now that I do have someone helping me. And it's like, do I want to go that route and just bust out a product? Or do I want to make something to the best of my abilities at all times, which is what I've done for the past 10 years? Well, you just uh, got to be true to yourself. Uh, well, that's that's where I'm struggling with that's at the a moment. Good answer. Yeah, like that's I so want to make the highest end product. What you want, or make uh, what? Well, I, I I just want to make an item. I just like manufacturing. So for me, I get at the end of the day, I get as much joy as making the two hundred dollar product as making the eighty dollar products. I made it. I don't really care how the finished quality is. The price is always reflected on the product. I don't I don't really care. If it's not the best version of what I made, it, it but like if I made the eighty dollars product and sold it at two hundred dollars, yeah, I'm an asshole. But like if I priced it accordingly, I don't really care. I just enjoy making the product and seeing that I I made something out of an idea in my head to a finished item. And like they saw me do something today is I had nothing uh, when I went to the shop Saturday and I worked a thirty six hour shift just now and I got a production fixture made and a full new prototype like ready to heat treat and like done. And it's my favorite thing is from nothing to something. So it doesn't uh, the quad like the the way I finish it doesn't really matter as much to me as much as making it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I think that at some point, if if the the process of producing an item and the result of the quality of the item are like it, it's one math problem. I don't, I don't know. It's a tough one. Oh, it's a tough one. It's one <laughs> at I've least, been pondering at least for, for the, a while. For the for the for the item, I don't know that you're ready to talk about it. But for the item that you're making, I don't no, know. No, yeah, yeah. You, you know what, talk, what it is. I'm just that's why I'm like just kind of yeah. talking about what what it could, what it could be. Let, let me let me let me let me take that and, and run with it a little bit, Justin. You, you mentioned the blatant. Obviously, it's cheaper to make in, in China. So I mean, I wish think, it wasn't. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, but I mean, do you do you think that you are pushing your designs to a point because you know that there is no limit to the to the production? I mean, uh, you know, like the design is the manufacturer kind of thing. Wait, what? So the way you're designing, you're designing in an in a way that's there's no boundaries to yeah. your designs. Yeah. So <clears throat> in my shop, so. I'd like to think of myself as a knife maker and designer, but the reality of the situation is I'm doing a lot more designing than I am making. In my shop, I just have very basic, a small grizzly manual mill and a surface grinder and a two by 40 or a a real grind, two by 72 grinder. Um, Just, you know, basic manual. So I can build knives and I enjoy building them. But when I sit down to design, um, if if I'm going to design something that I'm going to hand make in my shop, I have to kind of hold back on, you know, how crazy or extreme I get. I can't do inlays. I don't have a, um, a pantograph. I don't have a CNC machine. So if I'm going to do something that has inlays, you know, there's no point in me working on that design that has inlays unless I'm going to uh, try to submit it to be a collaboration. So... For me, the collaborations are awesome because, you know, I can I can be really creative without holding back because um, I know that they can 
they can do these things that I can design that I can't do with the tools that I have in my shop. Hmm. I, I mean, especially when it comes to the the inlays and, and stuff, it's it's wild. I mean, there's no reason to. I don't know. It's crazy how they can how they can do all that work for for that price. I mean, obviously we're, we're oh, all in that same. Absolutely, boat. there's definitely there's and that's the other thing. It's like there are still people who complain about the price, which is fine. I mean, you know. I can't afford to buy $150 knives all the time. I have no money. I barely scrape by. And so I know $150 is a lot of people or a lot of money for a lot of people. But there are still people who complain like, that's so much money, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, okay, $150 is a lot of money. But if you sit down and think about the amount of machine time, and that's what I was saying, like there's two scales. Each scale has two different inlays. All of those have to be machined separately and it has to be machined twice and it has to be machined together because it has to be machined separately for the out for the, you know, the outline. It has to be like basically you would rough machine the scales, perfectly machine the pockets, rough machine the inlays, but perfectly machine the outer diameter of them. So you got to make all those different parts take all of them off, epoxy them together, put them all back on the machines, and then finish machine them together. And it's got the pockets on the inside, and the blade has, on the angst, has four grinds and two fullers. A normal blade only has two grinds. This thing's got four grinds and two fullers. I mean, that is a lot of machine time, and that's a lot of machine work. Machine time costs money. Like Nick was saying, if I, you know, cut down the number of chamfers that's going to cut down your machine time. If I, uh, you know, change the feeds and speeds, you cut faster so that it's rougher. That's going to cut down the machine time that cuts down the cost. So, you know, people don't sit there and look and consider how much machine time is in this. And I honestly thought that those angst were going to cost way more money than they cost. I'm so happy that they got those at that price point that they did. I think it's absolutely amazing. And with S35 VN steel, I mean, it's not a cheap, you know, it's not a cheap, crappy steel at that price. And see, that's I hate that too because that that's the same thing as like we have we have taught people that things from China, made in China, should just be like you shouldn't even think about the price. It's like five bucks. Like, don't even worry about mm-hmm. it. So when it does come to something like that, where it's like, no man, like any country that this is produced in, there's still a lot of work into right. it. You're not you're not getting a cheaper product here. It's the labor dollar that right. we're arguing exactly. over. The labor dollar is cheaper, right. not the actual <coughs> thing. Like the yes. S35 costs the same thing. The micarta, pro- okay, well, that might be a little cheaper, but in any case, it's all fairly relative, but what we're paying less for is the labor dollar, not right. the not the product. Exactly, you're correct. You're paying less for the labor dollar. People also, you know... Um, with we you know as we got bigger and bigger and as kaiser was doing more and more collaborations and you know i think of kaiser kind of starting in my mind uh kaiser kind of starting this whole thing a little bit um i think they were doing more like, were more collaborations proposed. a little bit earlier yeah so when they when they mm-hmm. started doing those collaborations with Matt C, they were also working at that same time with uh, Ray Laconico. How, I'm sorry if I'm saying his name wrong. Um, I think they were both working with him, them at the same exact time. And so with those two big names way back then, they were kind of, and then at the same time taking on Matt Degnan and then shortly after taking me on. So they took on two big names and then they took on two people who were small names right at the same time and they had this big push well that sort of was taking off and was doing well and kaiser was listening to matt c and to ray laconico as they were both saying you need to change to this you need to do this different you need to change to that you need to do this different use ceramic use the black ceramic this white ceramic that doesn't work don't use that for whatever reason blah 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 and <clears throat> They were listening and they were making changes to make it better and to make the product better. And then we came along and saw, you know, this is working and we started doing the same thing. And they're like, we can do this and we can make a really good product. And if I think a lot of the companies like we saw, if we make a very good product and we put the time and effort into making it good and quality, 
people will see that they can get a good product from China. And, you know, six years ago, people were a lot more like hesitant to buy the China made knives and there was still a big stigma around it. And now, you know, people, they know that if they buy a Wii knife, they're going to get something that is really, really, really good quality. If they buy a Riot, Riati, Riot, it's going to be really good quality. If they buy a Kaiser, it's going to be good quality. These companies, you know, they realize that they can make a good product. So if they make a good product, they're going to get a lot of business. So it is totally what you're saying. It's you're, it's just that you're paying cheaper labor. Yeah, but even then, their, their pricing structure is kind of odd. It, it, you're familiar with them. It's like I've I've worked on uh, on some things that I want to get done. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, it's kind of like where I, when I design, I design within my limits. There's things that I want to do, but I know I don't have the machine capability or the machine knowledge, or it's like I just can't do that at a reasonable cost. Yeah. Uh, or it's like I don't want to make a knife that has a six piece like frame. It's like this is just insane. Like if Elijah showed me, he's like, oh, Nick, I want you to make Eskaton. I'll be like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> totally I, fair. It's only a three-piece frame, Nick. Mm. <laughs> well, no, there's a three per side or whatever. It is. Uh, whatever. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. It's <laughs> yeah. still yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you show me the machine, I'll be like, fuck off. Uh, but you go to them and it's like, yeah, we'll make it for the same as a frame lock. And like for me, knowing machine this costs, machining costs like it's obviously costs a lot more money to make that but it's like now we'll do it like you, you got quotes it's like oh like a frame lock cool it's this price inlay uh, a frame lock with inlay it's still the same price i'm like that makes no sense yeah i don't know how they i don't know how they do it i, I mean it's like they see it as the same thing so they, yeah. they charge the same price i don't know how they get the pricing but i mean it's like well, well, it's them to build me a car it's like that charges a little bit more yeah well, what I found at that point, it's mainly more labor, but like they don't charge for machining hours. Yeah. Yeah. Like the US shop does. Cause like it's like, oh, the machine runs it. Like I don't think they charge hourly. Like in, in America, we charge hourly for machine hours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think they do that. I just think, oh, the machine's running. Like we, he set it up and if it takes an hour, yeah. if it takes five hours, just let it run. Right. Well, they that's probably how stuff. that's probably how that's so much better pricing then, because that's what and, it, you know, if that's the case, then it's like you said here in the U.S., the machine time, you know, dictates the price. And that's why here in the U.S., everything, it's four times the cost. If you tried to make that angst here in the U.S., oh, my God, <laughs> there's no fucking way. Dude, I had people. OK, so the baby Barlow. um, the very first run of the baby Barlow uh, was 100% US. And I don't, some people, I'll call it a semi custom. Some people call it custom. Some people call it semi custom. Some people call it uh, mid tech, whatever. Uh, the scales and inlay, because I can't do those inlays in my shop, the scales and inlay uh, were OEM with a shop in the US. The blade blanks were wire cut with a shop in the U.S. And the pocket clip was wire cut with a shop in the U.S. And then I did all the grinding and all the hand finishing and all the assembly and all the lockup and lock bar and all that stuff uh, myself. And that was the first run of that was a limited uh, edition of 20 units. I can't remember what the exact retail was, but I think the retail was either 400 or 450. And I had some guy just ripping me to shreds because it's a small knife telling me that like, basically it should be like a hundred bucks or something because it was a small knife. Hey, I get that every week. Like literally all, I, all the, the, out of the four models I'm making right now, three of them are under two and a half inches. So yeah. <laughs> It's an email I kind of get. Like I'm like, if you're asking me that question, life's not for you, my guy. Yeah, but I was thinking with, about with shops in the terrible. U.S. It's no, with shops in yeah. the U.S. It's way more expensive. It's four times the cost. It's insane. What were you gonna say? When, I remember when you were talking about this when you first got it off the ground, and it was it was like nuts. Yeah, I the mean comparison oh, on prices. And the other thing, like we sold them for either four or four hundred and fifty, and. I mean, I shouldn't even say this, but just to put this into perspective, I lost money on those. I literally did not make a single dollar. 
Yeah, because you went with EDM, which is very overkill, I think, and like the most expensive service you could get on almost. I had to go overkill. I was going overkill. <laughs> oh, like why did you need to eat? Like you didn't have to EDM the pocket um, clip. I. No, you know what? I don't think I EDM the. I'm sorry, I said EDM on the clips. I don't think I EDM the clips, but they were CNC cut. Uh, the blade blanks were EDM because the shop had an EDM. They didn't have wire. I mean, they didn't have water jet, and uh, I wanted the precision because uh, the I wanted them to uh, EDM the uh, um, detent hole in the blade because. I wasn't going to drill through the scale to set the detent hole in the blade. If that makes sense, Nick. Uh, yeah, I got you. I've never heard of a new and de- uh, EDM in the detent hole though. In the blade. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can do that because the EDM can hold tighter tolerances and be smaller than water jet. I've seen people do water jet, which with oh, no, you, you could EDM down to a thou if you have the right. Idea. But they, for them to do that, that means they, were, they had a really like it just puts me in perspective to know what kind of job shop you worked with. That means they had a really fancy EDM that would pre-punch holes. Most EDMs have to work off an edge or pre-slaughtered holes in there. Well, that means their EDM is able to drill a hole, then go in and then clean it up with the wire. Well, two things. One, they had both of those machines. And two, the um, the Baby Barlow has so little space and so little room that the detent hole actually does run into the detent track. So it could cut the detent track and then just continue and cut the hole because oh they're, gosh, they're, 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 the they're connected. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's more understandable then yeah um so i just so that one shop did all of all of that you know it didn't have to go to two or three different shops it was all just done in that one shop but that just puts it in perspective i mean that was all done in the u.s and in my shop with hand work and i sold them for like four or 450 or whatever or urban edc did and i didn't make any money on them and yeah, so if which I, is reasonable for cnc in such a small like if like i do job shot work and if a guy comes up to me it's like oh yeah like I do work and it's like, what do you need? It's like, oh, like I'd like to make 15 of these folders. And I'm like, uh, I'm not the right guy for you. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I was going to make money on them, they would have had to have sold for over $500, you know, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I don't mean it as a complaint or anything. It's just trying to kind of put into perspective, um, you know, the difference between cost in the U S and cost in China. No, I, I trust me. I, I get it, so, especially the small knife thing. Like I make the, the MK1 and the micro. It's the same knife, just scaled smaller. Yeah. And like the price thing is something I struggle with for a bit. And I was like, like I can't charge the same for it. I don't need to charge the same for it. But at one point, I was charging like two hundred dollars less for the micro, and I was like, no, that makes no sense. It, it, all in all, it's maybe like ten dollars less, and not e- it's not even. It's like maybe five dollars right. less than. Which and is all, all machining and grinding. It's maybe an hour less in time. Yeah, like, that's not maybe. a dollar price justification and difference. Right, and that's the other thing that I was saying, where people don't know all these all these things, and you could have a two hour conversation about this, like uh, you know, educating people on this kind of stuff, because that's the same thing where people they still have it in their head that if it's a small knife, then it should cost less money. And they still, it goes back to the machining and exactly what you're saying. The They think it's less materials and it's smaller, so it shouldn't cost the same amount. And the amount less of materials does not offset the amount less that it's on the machine time, if that makes sense. Like, it's still on the machine almost as much, but actually depending on what the freaking design is it could be on the sh- on the machine more the baby barlow is fucking ridiculous to be perfectly honest i mean <laughs> like the the new baby barlow um like it's a really small knife it's a tiny knife it's i think the cutting edge is two and a half inches or something but it's got the pockets on the outside for the inlay um it's got pockets on the inside on the new design the updated design not for um g10 scales but if we do um titanium scales there's pockets on the inside to lighten it up and so you got pockets on both sides plus you have to have the machining time to make the actual inlays which are separate parts and pieces um and just 
every time you have an extra part or piece, it's extra machine time. So if somebody's looking at an average size knife that is very straightforward and simple and does not have extra parts and pieces and does not have inlays and they see a low price on it and then they compare it to a different knife that might happen to be smaller and more expensive, they think, why is it more expensive? It's so much smaller. Well, it could have twice the amount of machining time put into it. So if you don't consider the machining time, then you might be missing why the pricing is different. I'm thinking about maybe like designing a knife even more complex than the Escaton and, <laughs> and do it like as small as possible. And well, that's the other thing is smaller is not easier. Uh, no, like, oh no, the, it's way harder. Smaller yeah, is harder. way harder. Uh, what's they his only name? make ball bearings so big. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other issue. <laughs> and you that's used to small, be able to yeah. get you used to be able to get uh, 0. 0.0472 from Alpha, and they no longer have them listed. Yeah, because I bought out the entire stock of like 600 pieces. Because thanks I, a lot, Dick. <laughs> I started a batch of 300 yeah, yeah. knives, and I call her, and she's like, "Oh, like I'm like, you have this many, and they didn't have enough even to cover me." And I'm like, crap, well, I'm like, can I buy all 600 sets? And she's like, yeah. Like, I was making the imp. The They've two-inch had, frame lock, and I already pre-cut everything. She's like, oh, no, like, the, yeah. fa- the factory went out of business. I'm like, I guess I'm going to buy them all. Oh, they went out of business. I knew they were having issues with the factory, but the last I had heard directly from her a while back when I was trying to get them for the Baby Barlow production was that they were having issues with the quality from their uh no, factory. that business went out. It went out of business. They found a new shop, and they, you, you you could find the new forty seven thou balls, uh, but instead of ten balls, it's seven balls. USA Knife Maker carries them now, and Steve Kelly carries them. I, I saw Steve has them. Yeah, uh, so, I ordered from both of them, and uh, about a quarter of them, I get them. The balls, some balls fall out of them. Ugh, I hate that. I uh, had that in some of the early ones from Alpha. Yeah, so I'm not too happy with them. Thankfully, I still have some of the ceramic ones that I bought from Alpha. Yeah. It's like I started machining a batch of 300 knives. I'm like, oh, wait, the well, bearings are gone. <laughs> hey, Elijah, do you know, uh, does you. Uh, we like, do you know what their small sizes they use? You don't know. For what, their balls? Yeah. <laughs> how big are their balls? Uh, how big are their balls? Well, I don't think they go uh, lower than sixteenth. Oh Christ! Well, well then I'm gonna, never it's all the same. I've never seen anything. Well, I'm gonna have some issues 16. because I gotta find something smaller than sixteenth for uh, the baby yeah, Barlow. They, you, you get the forty seventh now. They make them now. It just like you just expect like a reject, right? Oh well, I'm sure uh, we could probably get whatever they need. Yeah, they'll mm-hmm. they'll get them. They'll get them. Cool. Um, it's all the same. They all come out almost out of the same manufacturer, pretty much. Yeah, but the. But, like I, people now more and more makers are, you know, saying, letting people know like smaller is not easier because everyone kept thinking smaller should be cheaper. And uh, I thought yeah, it was funny like, that I think, is it HMC? Is that his name? Hellion Machine Company? I forget what he, mm-hmm, he did. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, Jim, he, he did a video where he was talking about his uh, smaller version that's going to be a production knife. And it was perfect. He was like, you know, he said, he's like, I really love the knife. Uh, you know, I love the smaller scale down size. It's awesome. He's like, I thought I was going to enjoy uh, building it. And he's like, I just hate building it. He's like, I love the knife. I hate building it. Scaled down. It's too hard, like being that size. And I'm like, exactly. It's harder making a small knife. You have right. less room for error, literally less room for error. Uh, it, it's it just it. I'll put it this way. Everything gets smaller to where like a guy like me has large hands. I have to still grind a two and a half inch version of like the micro is two and a half inches long, but it's still a, a six bevel compound ground knife. Yeah. And like how many people do you see grind small knives like that, but are compound ground? The first batch I did was usually I do batches of 80 in my MK ones. I did a batch of 35 and like it was, like I said, it was $200 less than MK one. And like I did 35 and I was like, I'm done. Like this yeah. it sucks to grind. No. And like I was losing money. Yeah. yeah. And now I didn't haven't made it in like almost four years. And now I'm about to make, do a batch of 50 of them again. Like I made them a hundred dollars less, a little bit more reasonable, but at this point I've raised the price of the MK one and like the processes I have are just a little bit better to where like I, I could, like I could bust the grinds out a lot easier. Yeah. But yeah like who grinds two and a half inch compound grinds and enjoys them. And especially right. it's not like a long, <laughs> um, I'm going to do 60 of them right now. Yeah. 
your hands start cramping up. It's 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 not the, like I just do it because it's fun to make a small knife. Uh, but it's not easier. It shouldn't be cheaper. And like some cases like that grind, no. it just you could slip really quickly. Um, yeah, the ratio is different, and then it's uh, the blade is so small, it heats up really fast when you have to yeah. grind it. It's a pain in the ass. I need to get I need to get a water system for my grinder because oh my god, just like trying to grind those little baby Barlow blades that were they were only like 0.09 thick and they're only two and a half inches long. It was like swipe it across, dunk it, swipe it across, dunk it. It's just like oh, it takes forever. Eh, well, the, the imps that I made are one one uh, hundred thou thick and those are fine two inches th- literally the blade length was two inches and it was a warrant cliff so yeah it was full contact at all times and those were fine I, I i had a water system i used it for all five minutes and everything was coated in dirt and water and i was like this is horrible <laughs> it's a mess but i do prefer it I don't know, my, my dad watched me walk out of the grind room and i just had like a, like as if a motorcycle ran me over from my oh yeah to my, yeah it looks room. like you took a fucking mud bath yeah it, it's it's definitely messy, but yeah. So, uh, Jeremiah Two-inch blade 12 bevel. <laughs> I shouldn't mention it, but maybe this will like get my ass in gear. Cause it's a little bit partially my fault that it's stalling, but I do have something with a spring in the works. I was unsure as to asking about that um, (laughs) because I spoke with you about it at Blade Show last year. It's but still lingering. Is it? Yeah. It's what was what was the issue with fulfillment or purchasing? No, 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 no. It's just uh, the design is done. Um, All parties are happy with like the the design is done. All parties are happy with the design. to move forward to prototyping. The first prototype was made and then there needed to be some changes made. Um, The company was notified of the changes that need to be made, but then uh, we were discussing a little bit of changes um, to, I don't want to give anything away, but like uh, how we address the handle texturing or hand, like if we're going to, how we're going to handle either texturing it or, um, putting some kind of design on it or whatever. Hmm. And so we've been working on that and the holdup has just been like uh, finalizing that. So the first prototype was made. Um, We just need to finalize what we're doing with the handle and then get the second prototype finished. And then if we're good with the second prototype, then we can get production scheduled. Um, Oh, okay. So, so you, you have a prototype in your hands, though. Well, I don't physically them? have it in my hands. Uh, I don't okay. want to say any names of any companies, but the sure. company that I'm working with who contacted me to make this design with them has the prototype. Okay. All right. Um, so it exists, and it, it is the same thing. It's it's happening. <laughs> it's, it's happening. Just, you know, some point from now yeah. until the end of time. That is the release date. I know it's happening. Slowly sorry but for surely. The, sorry for the tease. It's uh, production is a slow, slow, slow thing. It's not fast. I mean, no, have you I talked about the project so outside slow. of anywhere else? Uh, probably only you and Elijah, and maybe okay. maybe uh one or two other friends that I DM knife designs to before they're shown publicly. I, I, there, there's Elijah and like two other people that I that I send designs to in early stages that I know like won't show it publicly and stuff like that. Gotcha. Well, that that kind that kind of works because we were we were just talking about talking about future projects. Well, I have a ton so I guess of that's, other stuff you know. in the works. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's I have a ton yeah, of future projects. On? Well, I've got so I've got the button auto, which is what we're talking about, and I don't want to give away anything else because it's too far Ooh, out. But news. there's a button auto coming. Um, there is a um, there is a new front flipper coming with Kaiser. But that one's probably kind of far away because I, um, well, I don't know how fast they're trying to get it out, actually. Um, I submitted the design, I don't know, one or two months ago, and they approved it. Um, I'm not sure. So, I, I mean, it's in, it's scheduled for prototyping. So there's a new front flipper with Kaiser. Um, 
there's a new integral design with we uh my first integral i think um i think i've shown you the designs you're gonna have to dm me that like right now (laughs) no i've shown it to you i've dm'd it to you i think i may have seen them Okay. No, because this is, again, one of those yeah. things where, well, I haven't seen yours, but you've seen mine. Sounds a little kinky. <laughs> um, mm. Elijah, this is the one where <laughs> I told you I was doing an integral. Actually, uh, this is, goes to an interesting point. but um, Oh, shit. Yeah, I've seen that, I think. Out of G10 and carbon fiber rather than an integral out of titanium. So there's no titanium. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it has liner. There's it's an integral G10 or integral carbon fiber with the liner for the lock, but the body is integral. So you don't see any lock bar cut on the outside like you would with an integral titanium frame lock. And you don't see any construction screws except for the pivot. Yeah, I tried that six years ago. I split it though. I got the spine a little too thin and I never tried it again because I don't have another piece that thick. And I spent a I'm shit ton on. of time slotting out the carbon fiber and I didn't want to do it again. Mm-hmm. And I'm what were you going to do for the lock bar? Right now. Yeah, you Esse- told me. Essentially, essentially, exactly what you, the, the, the subliner essentially. Yeah, okay. Uh, while while it was, everything was mounted vertically to mill out the guts, I uh, just moved that and mill over, cut off another, another pocket. Right, 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 just, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like that. So I have that coming with we, um, and, uh, I have, I just submitted one or two nights ago, a new design to we, um, for their Civivi line. So I finally have something in the works for Civivi. And, um, I have something in the works with Cancept, which is if people don't know if Cancept, uh, K A N S C P. Did I say it? I thought it was like concept. Yeah. Concept. I, maybe it's concept. Every I don't time. know. But it's K A N S P E T. Um, and they're a small company that just started. And the people who started it are previous previous uh, Kaiser employees. It's Joyce, isn't it? She's over yes, there, right? Yes, it's Joyce. So my very first contact was Joyce at Kaiser. She was the first person I had in contact at any of these companies. And Joyce is awesome. I love her. And she's always been good to me. She was always the one that, like, whatever she said she was going to do, she fucking did it. She was, like, the one person who got shit done, did what she said, followed up. She was awesome. She was amazing. Um, and her and one or two other people uh, left Kaiser and started Cancept and she'd contacted me and asked me if I wanted to do some designs with them and kind of thought about, you know, what I want to do with them for a little bit. And I told her I would, and I was thinking about it for a while. And so I sat down and uh, made a front flipper design for them that they're working on. Hmm. Wow, that is that is a lot of future projects. You've you've got a lot going on. Okay, <laughs> that's this. Yeah, that's and that's a lot. and then and then I'm still waiting on the Black Void Opus and the OSS daggers, and I'm still waiting for the Contrail to hit from Kaiser as well. Oh, and there's another new thing coming from Kaiser that I don't know if I should put the word out yet or not. Uh yeah, you might as well. Well, we'll just say it's the way it's kind of worked, not intentionally, but just by chance, is it's sort of worked out that each year something new is done with the Feist. So there's some new stuff coming with the Feist, and that should hopefully be really soon. That's good to keep that carried uh, carried forth. Like, yeah, I feel really fortunate a, a for new how edition long every year. Yeah, I feel fortunate for how long it's, um, you know, the feist has been going and that, you know, how long it's kind of been growing and uh, that we've been able to, you know, do a new profile. It has shelf and, life. Thank God, knock on wood. <laughs> I mean, I feel very fortunate for the shelf mm-hmm. life that it's had already. And I feel like um, it still has a little bit to go. And with some of the stuff that um, that's coming, I think it will only help it. 
there's a little bit of updates mm. coming and there's a, a new uh, blade profile coming. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So some people who might have had certain small complaints here or there, they might want to check it out again when some new stuff comes out. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. All right, right on. Well, damn. Okay, that's that's a that's a lot happening for the for the future for dates yet untold to be released. Yeah, at. I don't have any dates for any of it. <laughs> nice. That's consistent. I like it though. Okay, constant, we didn't have dates before, and we sure as hell don't have dates it's now. Like the yeah. answer that nobody wants to hear, but at least I'm consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that works. That works. Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's I mean, it right. sucks for me, too. I mean, I literally don't know when I'm fucking seeing any of this shit. So, like, I'm in the same boat. It's I. It's not that I know and I won't tell. I literally 100% don't fucking know. Totally fair. <laughs> we get it. We get it. No one's going to hold it against you this time. But in reality, but when you, you do see it. No, I really don't. So good. I really don't. <laughs> but you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, Elijah, you have to send me those uh, those uh, integrals. You never What's showed that? me. I showed you mine. You didn't show me yours. Yeah. I showed you mine. You didn't well, show me yours. The one you've seen she said. is the uh, is it an it integral? The nostrum. Yeah, it was going to be the millet one. Remember, but yeah. they kind of disappeared and oh, fell off the he'll, earth. He'll send but, it over um, like a month. Maybe that goes way back. Yeah, it goes way back. I mean, this thing's like like four years old. Oh, millet. But the way I set it up is it's like like you were saying, it could be carbon fiber, aluminum, titanium, whatever, the body. And right. Then, yeah, because the mech is screwed on. It's an so I on. so I had wanted to do a uh integral carbon fiber for a really long time. And uh Owen Wood showed a so back up for a second. You know, um the Suru by Vox. It's not an integral. The Suru, it won, I think, design award uh, for Fox knives. It's a Vox design. I think it yeah, won. It's, like about, it's, it's, it's like a short, wide knife. Yeah. I think it won the Blade Show Award last year. Um, and he did carbon fiber scales. And the lock side is carbon fiber with the carbon fiber lock bar. <laughs> you, you guys aren't aware of that one? Yeah, like it won. No, I'm aware. Yeah, it won best uh, the overall design or something for being an all carbon yeah. fiber frame lock. Yeah. So I think, and I, I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. <laughs> I have absolutely nothing against Vox. I love his work. I think he's an awesome guy, and I think he does awesome work. Um, but that's not the first time that that's been done. The first time that that's been done with. And I'm not saying he claimed that it was. I don't think he said that. Um, but the first time that somebody did a frame lock with the lock side being carbon fiber was Owen Wood. You know, Owen Wood is one of those high end art knife makers who does really incredible, beautiful work. And he had posted some images years ago. Um, but they're on his Instagram if you go way back into his Instagram. And instead of it being an art knife, it's it was kind of his attempt at sort of a tactical knife. And I, th- I think it didn't really take off and it didn't really catch on because it just the aesthetic of it, it wasn't his art knife thing and it wasn't really catching people in the tactical world. So it just kind of fizzled. Um, but it was carbon fiber lock bar. Um, and as soon as I saw him do that, I was like, oh my God, this should be an integral like why is it a, why is it two slabs it's carbon fiber just mill out the middle make it an integral um of course there's a whole bunch of issues of trying to get like uh the internal pockets for bearings and stuff like that but so i reached out to him and i was like started talking to him about it and asking him if i could do it as um take that idea and make it an integral and he was like oh my god well thanks for emailing me and asking me he's like yeah that would be awesome just you know call me like or um just give me credit for you know this idea or whatever and uh, i think he had even said that he submitted it to blade magazine um you know see if they would do a write-up on it or something because he hadn't seen it done before but they weren't they didn't do any write-up or anything on it um 
But then I just kind of lost interest. I actually started to build one and then I heat treated the blade and I snapped it trying to bend it straight, trying to bend a warp out of it. And then I lost interest in it because I was trying to, I wanted to strip away as much junk as I could and make it as clean as possible. And so if I was going to make it integral, then I wouldn't have the construction screws that are holding the scales together on the front. I would only have the pivot screw on the front and then uh, just the screws holding the lock bar insert on the lock side. But then I just kind of lost interest because I was like, well, I still have the lock cut. Then you have the lock bar screws. And then you have the screws holding the pocket clip. How can I make this cleaner and cleaner and cleaner? Um, and so then that was how I came to the idea of what we were saying with the integral G10 or integral carbon fiber with just the liner on the inside. Um, instead of the lock bar cut out of it. Hmm. So that's one of the yeah. ones that hasn't been seen yet that's coming with Wii. Gotcha. The integral. That's a, oh, that's the pretty integral exciting. Body, I'd be to see that. The integral body. I guess that's going to make, uh, that's going to make four CF integrals that they're going to do because I'm thinking about like throwing them a couple designs mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you were saying. I think whatever one you might have shown me must have been an older one because I don't think I've seen the ones you're working on now. Unless I just forgot. I'll, I'll shoot over the new stuff. I'm yeah. working on three different uh, carbon fiber integrals and they're all different constructions. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're all like different some are like constructions. Full integral. One is a full integral and then uh, two are semi integral. Oh, okay, okay. So. This one this one that I was doing was full. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be like super clean. That was the goal. That was what I was going after. And again, I love when we part of what's so amazing about we is their willingness and openness to do things that sometimes you're like, are they going to go for this? And most other companies would be like, Ugh, we don't want to do that. Like, um, yeah, they're not afraid I, to fail. Yeah. So for this and for <laughs> for this integral, I wanted it to be super, 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 super clean and strip away as much crap as I could. And um, so with a lot of integrals, um, you know, you see the pocket clip screws on the outside and they were willing to put them on the inside, which I went through a whole bunch of, oh, this was another one of those times where I think I, I can't remember. I might've shown you, Elijah. Um, mm-hmm. I went through a whole so bunch of ways them of put them, I was know, I went through a whole bunch of ways inside. to try to hide the screws and make it user friendly and easy without having to have a special mm-hmm. tool like Michael I'm Raymond. The same problem. And I had yeah. the exact idea that Michael Raymond had when he came up with the, the perfect solution. I had the same exact idea before he had posted it, but I couldn't do it on my design because of the placement of the clip. And if you look at his, what it is, is the way the, um, the way the, the, you can take a regular Torx and just drop it yeah, in between the, clip the scales. Yeah, the clip has like a pin. Yeah, the it goes like a pin sinks that you in. Press in. Yeah, and then threaded, you can, yeah. you can put the screw straight down between the scales and screw it in going Absolutely straight down. Absolutely genius. Right. Yeah. Well, I had the same idea. The problem is that you have to have the pocket clip has to be over mass material. Like it has to be over the mass of the backspacer material. There has to be material there and my pocket clip is centered and there's no material under it. So it won't work. So I have to just do that thing where you put it in at an angle and you have to have a special tool, but we was willing to do it and willing to make a special tool to go with it. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. That's exactly what I'm trying guy, to get into huh? too. Okay. <laughs> well, they said yes to me. <laughs> I wasn't like, sure if they would or not. <laughs> yeah. I think what some of the stuff that we're doing, like that you're doing with them and that I'm doing with them, it's really going to change like their, their whole like way of doing stuff moving forward, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. well, I That's think, exciting. I mean, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I, I think it's good that they're willing to just not be afraid to try stuff that, you know, is outside of what you see every single day from every other production company. 
Yeah, I mean, you got to yeah, push it crazy. to the limit. That's it. Like, if you're just going to do the same sort of slab side frame lock flipper stuff, you're going to stagnate. The market right. deserves and and is starving for something interesting. Right. You know, not not the mundane. If you're going to create the mundane, just like, I don't know, step aside. Like, it's just not. Yeah. Nobody cares. Well, I think they were <laughs> smart to be willing to do that. And they're smart to, like, make sure that they do it well. So. Yeah people get excited know, it's gonna you know. be it's gonna be a slight pain in the ass for the assembly because like if you're thinking what i'm thinking it's a tool a lot like what stan wilson uses that has yeah. to go in there you know and go right from the side and screw it in but i mean but it is a little bit but here's the thing with time. with with my design um there's only there's only a full liner on the lock side. There's not a full liner on the other side. There's only like a quarter liner on the other side. Now, when you want to take it apart mm -hmm. to take the blade out, you don't have to fuck with the screws where the um, pocket clip on the butt end of the liner are. You can just loosen the pivot, take the pivot out and slide the blade out. Like, I mean, it would be a little bit of a pain in the ass to put everything back in because of the, um, you know, the bearings or whatever. Um, and I don't have a mm -hmm, prototype yeah. in my hand yet, so I'll play with that and see. But I think that it will not be that big of a deal. Like, to just leave the pocket clip alone and not take it on and off if you want to open the knife and just use the pivot and just slide the blade in and out, I think it will be doable without being an issue. Yeah, because they're still you're still, like, uh, treating them as integrals at that point. Yeah, so yeah exactly. Straightforward. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you don't have to, you'll get, you should, you'll get the tool. So if you need to take the pocket clip off for some reason, but you wouldn't need to take it off just to clean the knife out. You could just take the blade out, clean everything. So out. yeah, like just to like wrap it up, I guess, like is the, is your mechanism there? Is it similar to Michael's or Michael's is it like different in a way? Wait, Michael who? Yeah, Michael Raymond, his uh, his clip, his clip system. Oh no, 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 no! I had the same idea before I saw him post that mm -hmm. because I was trying to figure out a bunch of different ways, but I cannot do what he's doing because. Okay, so yours is like separate. Mine is just a standard clip with screws on the inside, a standard way that they would Got be it. on the inside. Okay. His, his screws. Instead of going, instead of uh, going in under the pocket clip like a standard knife, the screw is turned ninety degrees and it's going straight down. Like if you're dropping it down between the scales, his screw is at that angle. And the way he's able to do that is under the pocket clip is like a long shaft that drops down into the scale and into the backspacer, and then the screw goes down between the scales. And screws into the shaft. That's knife wizardry right there. Yeah. That's that's some that's some so highly that mechanical. That means you craziness. can just use a regular Torx that you have sitting in your garage. You don't have to have a special tool. Which mm. is hilarious because he makes special tools anyways for all of his knives. <laughs> uh, but it makes yeah. it that much easier to get to. And because his knives are integral, it's easier for him to get the screw in that way and attach it. It's it's extremely smart way to do it. Right. Yeah. This the special tool thing is a lot of fun though. It makes, you know, it's yeah. special. Yeah. 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 Cool. Definitely. All right. Well, there's there's a lot to there's a lot to look forward to from from your lineup uh in the future here. Hopefully we can all get to a knife show one of these days and yeah. and 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 check it out and and keep an keep an eye out for those for those new releases. Yeah. Oh, um I was so looking forward to Blade this year before this whole COVID thing hit because it was going to be, you know, even I don't even regardless of the timing as far as stuff hitting the market, it was going to be with um, Kaiser was going to be the Contrail would be there, the new Feist stuff would be there with the new Blade profile, with We was going to be the Black Void Opus, the OSS Dagger, the Angst, and then with both companies possibly like maybe one of the next knives prototypes were going to be there now it's just mm. like oh, all these all this covid shit 
So, Justin, what's the what's the next show that we should expect to see you at? Are you are you going to the rescheduled Blade? I, do you do USN? I don't what's, have. What's uh, well, I had only been going to Blade show. I'd like to go to USN. I haven't made it. Um, I don't have any plans for any shows at this moment. Okay. Uh, I'm teetering back think, and forth uh, between USN whether or not be a good good one to go. Yeah. We'll see. It's just with the, you know, I was originally planning on going to Blade for sure this year. Sure. And then yeah. all this shit happened and all that, mm-hmm. you know, got canceled and the dates got changed and I haven't scheduled anything for the new dates. Um, I've kind of been just thinking it's very possible I won't show up. If I do, it'll be a last minute thing. Gotcha. All right. Well, hope, hopefully we can. Are you guys all going to be there? All- it's kind of the same. I'm in the same boat as yeah, you. Yeah, I think everybody's, yeah. I, I don't have tickets. I don't have a table. Yeah, right. Like last second, so I, I drive every year. So if like a week prior, right. I'm like, okay, like COVID looks fine. Right. Looks like there'll be a out. Like I'll just like, okay, I'll, I'll go take the weekend and drive out. My problem is I I think, I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe the turnout would be good. I feel like people aren't going to show up. Like I looked at the roster and I'm like, who are these people? Mm-hmm. And that was the thing. It's a lot of guys that, because so I didn't have a table this year because uh, I was supposed to share with someone, whatever. Uh, but I was like, no, there was like a hundred people in front of me on the waiting list. Yeah, they had a giant waiting list this year, and uh, so all the people who pretty much canceled their tables, the whole waiting list, are like, oh yeah, this is my chance. But they're like, it's their first show. They're not realizing what's happening. I think and they're like, yeah, uh, we'll just join. Right. You look at that roster. I'm like, who are all these people? I haven't even looked at it. I just yeah, it's all those people are like, oh, they just changed the dates. Okay, that's fine. We'll just do that then. And they have no <laughs> idea how the industry <laughs> works. Right. Right. Like, right. Like, like, yeah, uh, <laughs> like it's not that bad. Like, oh, we're just gonna go <laughs> sometimes. It's like it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but USN, I, I have I have a hotel and flight booked for that because it was just so cheap. I was like, yeah, I'll just pay for it now, and if anything, I'll get a refund. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I'd like to be at USN one of these days, uh, one of these years. I haven't been yet. Um, I don't have any plans right now, but we'll see. Okay. All right. Yeah, that that works. I think everybody's sort of in the same boat with planning. So right. it's a it's a fingers crossed scenario. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's still in a bit of a limbo state. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. We'll 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 look forward to we'll look forward to the future, and um and and all the designs. That, that are yet to come and uh and undetermined you know, time <laughs> exactly yeah Lo- love that love that time frame um that that being said what's uh what's the what's the best place to to find you where where do you where do you spend most of your social media time mostly just instagram it's just my name justin lundquist l-u-n-d-q-u-i-s-t i have a website under the same name uh it's not really kept up to date um but it's there and there's a store on there that at some point I'll attempt to put some stuff into. Um, but mostly I'm just on Instagram. Okay. So definitely if, if, uh, if somebody wants to find you get on the gram yeah. and, uh, and look, look for Justin's work. If you're, if you're not familiar with him already, uh, please do so. Cause there's, there's some excellent, uh, there's some excellent stuff on there. And, and I, and I actually learned, learned a lot tonight about, uh, the, the photography background, which is cool. Uh, I have many more questions that I will, that I will wait to ask about that. Um, and, and on that note, I, I want to thank you so much. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to have you on. And I, I think we're going to, we're going to head for the head for the wrap here. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with, uh, with signing off. This is, this is Jeremiah Burbank from uh, PVK Vegas is the day job. Check it out on Instagram. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, it's Nick Chuprin of NCC Knives. You can find me at nccknives.com or NCC Knives on Instagram. Thanks for giving that a listen. This is Elijah Isham of Isham Blade Works. You can find me on Instagram at Isham Blade Works. I'll probably be out in the woods. Thanks for listening, guys.